but also how well, well we have talked. So going to IFIX Treasury, uh, uh, so these are contributors. So like Alibaba and 40 Thieves, we have IFIX team and 50 contributors contributing this treasury. So it has basic video lectures, it has reviews of literature, it has something known as infographics where people can you know, have a look at that fracture at once or share with the parents info, info, important information about that fracture. And of course, we have recordings of all live sessions. So if someone has missed a session, they can go back and review that session later on. And this is information on how to access this. It has been sent to all the delegates. We have already delivered four sessions. So this is what it contained in the package on facial injuries total of nine items, then part two, which was on supercondylar fractures. It had 12 items, uh, and these are all there on the net. Lactocondyle fractures and other elbow injuries, it's expanding more and more material to the delegates. And for today's session, we have total of around uh, 10 items which are being given to the delegates. It's already on Ortho TV website, and this can be accessed only by people who have registered for iFix. So if your friend who has not registered for iFix, if you share a link, he will not be able to access. So ask your friends to register for iFix if they want to have an access. And I'm going to quickly take you through what it looks like. So when you click at the link, you are auto-registered to this treasury, which means if you use your username and password once, you don't have to do it again and again. Next time you log on, automatically it will take you to this treasury. And as you can see here, we have pre-recorded sessions and live sessions here. So if you go to the forum session, fracture session and say your mantra, Kulja Sim Sim, you have to say it two times. And if you say it, you get access to all the all the videos. So this is video. Binotti would recognize Sarang, this is video. You can see that very well. Yes. Sarang, Tell me. Sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, your slides are still showing. The redirection. My slides. Yeah, redirection. Okay, I will have to stop sharing and do it. Okay. No, no problem. Is the forum fractures. So you can hear Binotti, probably you cannot see it, but uh, that's all there is that is there um, on IFIX Treasury. Can you see this now? You have to share the screen. Again, I'll do it, I'll do it again. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so. In addition to IFIX Treasury, we have daily discussion group where delegates are sending their cases and we are replying to them. And lastly, we have this quiz, Inquisitive, uh, to test the knowledge. And uh, Dr. Swapnil Kelly and his team has done an excellent uh, job at uh, this quiz. And uh, uh, please attend to your sessions well. Don't go to sleep. Have a cup of coffee or tea near you so that question can come from any part of the session and you have to be awake to be able to answer that. So with this, I'm going to stop my uh, uh, small little note on what is special at IFIX uh, uh, 2020. Uh, I would request Premal Naik, it's uh, 625. We have already 116 participants uh, on, on who have joined. More people are expected to join by the time we start. So, Premal, uh, you can start the session now, introduce people. And uh, by the time you are ready and people come, we'll be start starting with the first lecture. Thank you, Taran. Uh, as the screen shows, probably we have uh, today a uh, lot of uh, lady pediatric orthopedic surgeons across the globe, from two from India, one from US, and one from UK. And I think it's uh, male participants are speakers are in minority today and that's what it needs to treat the program practice. You have got to be gentle and you have got to be uh, thinking well what we are, you are going to do and all these ladies of this group are going to tell you how you do that and then the things will end with distal radius. Dr. Joshua will be taking that and the last agenda on the meeting will be hand injuries. I think hand injuries is something we uh, don't uh, treat very seriously. We don't get them that often, but when we get them, we have no clue what happens to them. And uh, uh, Kevin, with whom I had uh, uh, association for a few years now and have worked with him, is going to have an excellent presentation on that. So uh, still we have some time and we'll have to wait for uh, uh, participants to join because we are still four minutes uh, early from the time. Uh, it may be a good idea to uh, share some memories of IFIX. 
So just uh, we, uh, it was uh, Dr. K. Wilkins who joined last time, inspired us that pediatric trauma uh, needs to be taught well, especially in a country like India where we have very young population. Because if you have a deformity which arises from a pediatric fracture, it has to remain there or it remains there for many decades, not like an older person. And 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 invalid child will be an invalid adult and will not contribute to society well. So with that idea, it was in 2013, first we had a small meeting at Mumbai and the formal conference was organized first time at Pune by Sandeep in 2014 and we had uh, excellent uh, participation with more than 250 delegates joining for the first course. It was a residential course and we had, uh, it was uh, it was to our surprise, uh, for a pleasant surprise that a lot of people were very enthusiastic. We created a WhatsApp group very soon and many pediatric orthopedic cases, especially trauma and sometimes non-trauma cases are being discussed there. So, once, if you are for the first time joining IFIX, you are already a part of IFIX group in WhatsApp as well as Telegram. Whenever you get a patient of pediatric trauma, even if it is an emergency, some of us will definitely guide you with a little bit of uh, experience we have, a little more than you will be able to guide you through your case. So our idea is basically to have generate um, the same uh, sense of uh, responsibility for pediatric trauma as we have, we are doing for adult trauma. And because there are hardly any dedicated course for pediatric trauma, it is our humble endeavor here to uh, start this course. I think we are about a minute away from our start and I'll request uh, Sheetal to introduce the foreign faculty and I'll, I'll start the presentation first. Sheetal, just hold on for a second. Yeah. Yes, Sheetal. Are we on? Can you hear me okay? Yes, I, we can hear you very well. All right, good morning everyone here in the US and uh, good evening uh, to, uh, to colleagues uh, on the east side of the globe. Um, and uh, welcome to IFIX uh, 2020. Um, and this is uh, our session on uh, forearm, wrist and hand. And I'd like to um, uh, welcome uh, the faculty. Um, uh, Susan Scholl, um, I've known her for more than 10 years. We have done uh, some work together uh, she um, was uh, in medical school from Boston University, uh, residency in uh, Sunny Down State, and then fellowship in Case Western. She's a professor of pediatric orthopedics at uh, University of Nebraska with uh, special research interest in trauma, orthopedic aspects of child abuse. And uh, she likes to play flute, scuba diving, and reading, which some of the things I did not know, but I'm glad to know that. Uh, so uh, welcome, Susan. Our next uh, um, uh, sp uh, speaker on the uh, international uh, faculty is uh, Claire Carpenter. She's a consultant trauma and pediatric orthopedic surgeon uh, in Cardiff, um, which I think is the young capital or the capital of the young people as, as I know it. Fellowship trained in uh, uh, West Med Children's Hospital in Sydney, member of the British Society of Children's Orthopedic Surgery with special interest in pediatric trauma. So welcome Claire. Uh, next is uh, Joshua Ebzuk. He's an associate professor in Department of Orthopedics and Pediatrics uh, from University of Maryland School of Medicine. Welcome, Josh. And Kevin, um, he is uh, my colleague here at Children's uh, Hospital. He did fellowship in hand and microsurgery at the Philadelphia Hand Center in, in Thomas Jefferson University, and then additional fellowship uh, at our hospital in pediatric uh, hand and is currently the director of pediatric hand program at our center and with special interest in upper limb surgery, especially congenital hand anomalies, brachial plexus, CP and upper limb trauma. And um, uh, he has been kind enough to come to India several times on our mission trip. And uh, I really appreciate all his efforts uh, towards teaching and patient care. So welcome, Kevin. Thank you, Sheetal. Um, Sheetal, many of the, you don't know that Sheetal belongs to our city and uh, he has, uh, done as undergraduate and postgraduate from uh, uh, my city as the city of Ahmedabad, which is in the western part of India, close to Mumbai. So basically, I am a pediatric orthopedic surgeon and had the uh, opportunity to start pediatric orthopedic services in the state of Gujarat. And I now uh, am attached to a local medical college as an honorary pediatric orthopedic surgeon. 
Uh, my colleague, Dr. Rujuga Mehta, she is a consultant of orthopedic and pediatric hand surgeon. She is attached to Jaslok Hospital, Nanavati Hospital, and Sushruta Hospital, Shushita Hospital. And she heads the Department of Pediatric Orthopedics as a very prestigious by by Wadia Hospital at Mumbai. And she's a trained fellowship at Boston Children's Hospital with Dr. Peter Waters. Welcome, uh, Rujita. Binoti, again, a very eminent pediatric orthopedic surgeon, very senior uh, colleague of mine. She's a consultant pediatric orthopedic surgeon and associate professor at a very busy department of orthopedic surgery at LTMG Hospital, Sai in Mumbai. And she heads the unit. And she has a wealth of experience in treating pediatric trauma, and we're going to see her excellent cases today. Samir is our colleague from Pune. Uh, he is a consultant orthopedic surgeon, and he is attached to KEM Hospital, Jahangir Hospital, and Sahyadri. Welcome, Samir. Anirban uh, has contributed to IFIX Treasury, but due to certain uh, social reasons, he is unable to join today. He is a consultant hand in a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. He works at America Super Specialty Hospital, Kolkata, West Bengal. And our last participant is Dr. Pushpavardhan Mandalecha. He is an assistant professor and consultant pediatric orthopedic surgeon, Sri Aurobindo Medical College and PGI Indore. Uh, and he works at a Little Bones Clinic at Pediatric Orthopedic Clinic Indore. Welcome, Pushpavardhan. Without wasting any time, uh, I'll stop sharing the uh, screen and I'll invite our first speaker, Dr. Susan, uh, to share her screen and uh, start her deliberations on forearm injury. The title is typically kept for all the participants to uh, sh show and indicate that there is a definitely way of doing uh, conservative treatment for forearm bone fractures. So Susan, please, uh, um, yeah. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yeah, yeah. Right Okay, great. Um, I'm excited uh, to be here and to be kicking this off. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, management of forearm fractures in children. Um, and these radial and ulnar diaphyseal fractures are less common than the distal radius fractures that are gonna be discussed in a little while. Um, they account for only about 3.4% of children's fractures and they require more aggressive treatment than the distal radius and ulnar uh, fractures because in the forearm, the deformity is more apparent. There's less remodeling. Um, the rate of healing is slower because the diaphyseal bone is a little less vascularized than the metaphyseal bone. And there's a higher refracture rate. These typically occur from a fall on an outstretched arm, um, often during sports, especially those with wheels or blades like skateboards or roller skates. Um, here in the Midwestern United States, they're much more common in our warmer weather from about April till September. Um, when you're diagnosing one of these, obviously you want to get a history and uh, have an idea of the mechanism. Physical exam, there's going to be swelling, there's often deformity. Um, you have to check the skin carefully to make sure that these aren't open. Um, and uh, you want to do a good neurovascular exam, uh, especially looking for compartment syndrome. And I, uh, you know, sometimes it can be a little difficult to get a good neurologic exam on a very young child in particular and any young child who's uh, in pain or discomfort, but you can do sort of this quick and dirty neurologic exam to get an idea of what's going on. And even a very young child who's uh, distracted by their injury can usually uh, be convinced to do these four simple uh, moves, rock, paper, scissors, and an A-OK -okay sign uh, that give you an idea of, of uh, on a sort of gross motor level, whether the median, radial, ulnar, and AIN nerves are uh, intact. Want to just make a little uh, mention about compartment syndrome in kids. It might be difficult to diagnose in kids. Um, it is a clinical diagnosis. We don't really use the five P's that they use in adults to rule out a compartment syndrome in children. We use the three A's. And the three A's are anxiety, meaning they can't be comforted. Um, agitation, meaning that they're wiggling around. They're kind of in sort of constant motion. And then the one that's probably the sentinel uh, finding here is an increasing need for analgesia. So if they're needing more than you would expect based on their age or their size, or if they're needing it at more frequent intervals, you need to have a high index of suspicion that there might be a, a compartment syndrome. And remember to carefully assess the joints above and below the obvious injury. So this is uh, actually quite a young child, about three months old, and this was a non-accidental trauma, but this child has a, a segmental fracture of their radius and also 
an intraarticular fracture of their distal humerus. So you have to check the joints above and below pretty carefully. Um, for diagnosis, we always want to get orthogonal views, an AP and a lateral. You can get comparisons if necessary. And again, the joints above and below the fracture as well. Our goal in general um, is to maintain axial and rotational alignment until the bone has healed. And generally the prognosis is good and the complication rate is low with close reduction and casting for these. So remember that remodeling is greater the younger the child and the closer the injury to the physis. So diaphyseal forearm fractures are gonna remodel less than distal radius and ulna fractures. Malrotation doesn't remodel, but it's pretty well tolerated and angulation will remodel at the rate of about 10 degrees a year. So for children with at least two years of growth remaining, you can uh, definitely accept 50% apposition. In more distal fractures, you can accept about 25 degrees of angulation and quite a bit less, about 10 degrees in mid-shaft fractures and up to about 45 degrees of malrotation. Bayonet apposition, which is 100% displaced by perched uh, perched on top of itself, is acceptable up to eight or 10 years. Some authors say 12 in a, in a boy. So the fracture patterns here are plastic deformation, uh, incomplete green sticks and complete fractures. Plastic deformation can happen in kids up to about 15 years, but it does tend to happen more in younger children. Um, you do have to keep an eye on this because bowing of the radius and ulna does functionally narrow the interosseous space and can lead to decreased pronation and supination. About 20 degrees of angulation will remodel in a child younger than four years of age, but if the child's older than that or the angulation is more than that, you want to reduce it. It can be a little hard to reduce this. Um, I have found that I'm not uh, uh, always very um, successful at doing this in the ED or in the clinic. Um, usually you need some general anesthesia or at least some very good conscious sedation because you have to do this sort of, it takes a long time, you have to do it slowly and it takes a fair amount of force. So you need to um, be uh, pushing against the deformity against a fulcrum like is shown in this picture here. Um, and again, this is sort of a long, slow process and it takes a little bit of time and it's a little uncomfortable for the child if they're awake. After this has been straightened out, you need to apply a well-molded long arm cast to prevent it from kind of springing back. Green stick fractures can usually be treated with a simple close reduction under conscious sedation and a uh, long arm cast. Um, older literature sort of recommended completing the fracture. Um, I tend not to do that. I can get a good reduction usually without completing the fracture and completing the fracture takes something that's inherently stable and makes it inherently unstable. So I try to avoid doing that if I can. For the complete fractures, again, usually a lot of these can be managed with a close reduction and casting, but you have to keep in mind and sort of warn the family that remanipulation may be necessary if it loses reduction, which some of them do. Um, this is an example of something called a K deformity. Um, this happens um, not infrequently in uh, fractures that have a pretty proximal radial fracture like you see here. Um, this is showing it kind of already healed. But if you catch this in the first week or two, you can sometimes uh, straighten it out by re-reducing the child in an extension cast. Um, and I've had pretty good luck doing that. So when you do a close reduction in casting, you wanna make sure that you have some adequate sedation um, or analgesia on board. We do most of these now with conscious sedation with ketamine. Um, we wanna start with gentle traction and counter traction. We use these finger traps quite a bit because typically we're kind of working alone in the ED. Um, and you want the counter traction to be no more than about 10% of the child's body weight. Um, and I usually let these hang up for a little while. The uh, gravity and ligament taxes help you here and get the fracture out to length and help you do some of the reduction without you even doing much of anything. And then um, this uh, schematic shows a more distal fracture, but, the, but the, the principle is the same. You're gonna exaggerate the deformity in order to unlock the distal fragment from the proximal fragment and be able to kind of flip it over and reduce it. Then you wanna do a three point mold as is shown here with slight flexion for a dorsally displaced fracture and slight extension for a volar displaced fracture. 
this is something that's important for diaphyseal uh, forearm fractures. Uh, you really want to shape your cast carefully and you want it to have a straight ulnar border that will pr help prevent that K deformity that I showed you earlier. And you want the cast to be oval as is shown in the bottom a uh, little schematic there and not round like uh, shown on the top. So you wanna look at something called the cast index. And basically uh, you don't want this to be round and, and the same all the way across. You want the height of the cast to be uh, about 0.7 of the width of the cast. That puts tension on the interosseous membrane and helps, helps hold your reduction. Usually these need a long arm cast for about four weeks. And then after that, you can switch them to a short arm cast or a splint and uh, usually follow these out for about a year. Physical therapy or rehab is rarely necessary um, in kids. The absolute indications for operative uh, management of these is an open fracture, uh, an inability to either achieve or maintain an acceptable alignment, and a child with a neurovascular injury such as a compartment syndrome or a carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, sort of uh, plus minus indications for operative treatment are comminuted displaced intraarticular or ficeal fractures. It kind of depends on the fracture and the age of the child. Um, if you have a floating elbow situation where you have a, an associated supracondylar, you're going to be there fixing that anyway. Um, bilateral fractures, it can be really hard to manage two long arm casts. So um, if you do a, a procedure, you can get that down to a short arm cast or a splint. And then a child with multi trauma who's going to be in the operating room for other things. Um, so when you're thinking about operative treatment of these fractures, um, you have to remember that rigid fixation is not always necessary in a child. They're going to heal quicker than an adult. We can accept a little bit of um, uh, inexactitude in our reduction, so they don't have to be as exact or as rigid as adult uh, constructs do. Um, you're going to perform any necessary adjunctive procedures. If it's open, you're going to do an IND. If they've got uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, you're going to do a release. If they have a, fa a car a compartment syndrome, you're going to do a fasciotomy. And the surgical approaches are pretty much the same as in adults. So what are our options? Um, intramedullary rotting and plating are the two big ones for diaphyseal uh, forearm fractures. Uh, for intramedullary rotting, you can use rush pins, you can use K wires, you can use the flexible nails. Um, the insertion uh, for the nails is proximal at the ulna and distal at the radius. Um, at the ulna, you can insert it right at the very tip of the ulna, but if you can cheat a little lateral and find that little flat border of the ulna, that gets the tip of the nail out of the way, um, and I think people tolerate it a little bit better. The radial uh, insertion can be either lateral or dorsal, and I'll talk about that in a minute. You usually want to put a little, um, little bend at the end of the nail to help you when you're kind of manipulating these through the fracture site. So this is an example of a fracture that we treated with intramedullary nails. Um, if you are using a rigid device like a um, K-wire or a rush rod, you may need to pre-bend it a little bit to mimic the radial bow. If I'm using the flexible nails, I find that they do that kind of on their own and I don't really bend them too much. Um, you can uh, leave the ends of these percutaneous, but I much prefer to bury them. Um, these tend to stay in pretty long. They're not coming out in three or four weeks. I'm usually leaving them in uh, upwards of three months, and that's a long time to have something uh, outside the skin. Um, and these aren't so easy to take out in the office, even if you do leave the ends out. So it's another trip to the operating room anyway to take them out. So I like to, to bury the ends of these. Um, you don't necessarily have to fix both bones. Uh, this is an example of one. Um, this was an open fracture. This uh, was the child of two physicians at my institution, and I could not for the life of me get this radius um, uh, in a position where I, I was having an easy time getting a nail down. So I just fixed the ulna, and even with the ulna, you can see I didn't get it terribly distal, uh, but he healed up fine. I took the rods out recently and, and he's remodeled and he looks great. So you don't always have to go for a home run with these. You just need to get it where it'll heal in a good position. Um, and I usually do put them in a short arm cast or at least a splint afterwards for a couple of weeks. Um, so the, the pros of this is that it's a minimal dissection. These are, uh, you know, small um, incisions to put them in. And if you need to open, you can usually do it through a small uh, uh, dissection. They're relatively easy to remove, although you do need to go to the operating room to do it. And there's a pretty low refractor rate here. 
The cons with these are there is a higher infection rate than with non-operative treatment, that makes sense. Um, when you put in that radial nail, whichever insertion point you choose has its own little pitfall. So if you're using the lateral insertion uh, site, uh, the superficial radial nerve is kind of right there and you have to try to avoid that. And if you're using the dorsal insertion site, there have been uh, uh, cases of uh, extensor pollicis as long as tendon rupture. Um, so you have to keep that in mind. Uh, you know, this does involve some radiation and you do have to take them out. So that's a second trip to the operating room. Uh, the big one here though, I've, I've highlighted in red, there's a risk of compartment syndrome if you pass the nail, try to pass the nail too many times. So you need to num limit the number of passes before you open at the fracture site. So three shots at it or less than 10 minutes of, of kind of trying. And if you can't get it, uh, under those parameters, go ahead and open at the fracture site and uh, try to uh, do a, a reduction that you can see and then pass the nail that way. And these do take a little longer time to, to heal than a, a closed fracture does. So never force the nail down. If the nail doesn't pass, rotate it, withdraw it and wiggle it around and reinsert it, take it out and use a smaller nail. If the very smallest nail doesn't pass, um, use something smaller like a KY or a Steinman pin, or you know, if you really can't get it to work with uh, with intravaginal nailing, you can bail and switch to a plate. This is a case that uh, Chital probably recognizes. This comes from his institution. Um, this was a, a two millimeter nail. They were having a lot of trouble getting it past the radius. Um, and they were trying pretty hard and struggling. And then they realized that all of that kind of pushing with that nail had caused a uh, um, separation of the physis up here. So don't, don't force these things. If they're not working, try something else. Um, the other option is plating. We usually reserve it for kids a little on the older side, heading into the the pre-adolescent adolescent phase. The technique is the same as in adults. You want to use two separate incisions to prevent the synostosis. Usually that sort of direct lateral approach to the ulna and a Henry type approach to the uh, radius. Um, use in open fractures is, you know, a little controversial, but I think there's, you know, they do it all the time in the adult world and it, it it, it's reasonably safe. There is a, a pretty high risk of refracture after plate removal. Um, they can fracture through the, the screw holes. They can also fracture with the plates in. Uh, these plates do become a stress riser. So the pros here are that this is an accurate reduction. It's an anatomic accurate reduction typically, and this is really rigid fixation. The cons are that this is a pretty wide dissection. You do need to, in a kid, go and take these out again. And there's this risk of refracture again. Like uh, I said, you can it can happen through the, the holes after you take it out, but it can also happen with them in because these are stress risers. So that's what happened to this child. And I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about Montagia fracture dislocations. These are fractures of the proximal ulna with a dislocation of the radial head. This is easy to miss in a child. Um, anytime you see a radial head dislocation in um, a child, look for, for a fracture of the ulna. It may just be plastically deformed. And the converse is true. If you see what looks like an isolated ulnar shaft fracture, really take a careful look at the radial head and make sure it's pointing at the capitellum uh, because you don't want to miss a Montagia fracture. So this is uh, what they look like. You've got this ulnar shaft uh, fracture and the radial head is not pointing at the capitellum on either of these views. This is the Bado classification. This is uh, the most uh, common classification of these. The type ones with an anterior dislocation of the radial uh, head are by far the most common. The type threes with sort of a lateral dislocation are, are the second most common and make up the bulk of the majority the rest of the fractures. The other two kinds are pretty rare. So this is what that looks like schematically. Generally, these can be treated non-operatively in kids, especially if you catch them in the first day or two. And uh, I used to do them all in the OR, but I found with good conscious sedation, I can do it down in the ED. You wanna correct the ulnar deformity and reduce the ulnar fracture and reduce the radial head and then relieve the deforming forces, which typically means that these need to be in a little bit of flexion um, and uh, supination. So this is one uh, that was treated with a closed reduction and is healed. You'll notice that uh, we kind of reversed the ulnar bow a little bit. And sometimes you need to do that to get the radial head to sit down and that's okay. That'll, that'll remodel and do okay in a child. Um, if you uh, can't 
get the ulnar reduction to be uh, in a stable position that allows the radial head to sit back down, you uh, could go ahead and plate or I am rod it. Um, occasionally, the radial head needs to be reduced uh, via an open incision. That's usually those type threes. And if you have a type four where both the radial neck and the ulnar are fractured, those are kind of unstable and usually need to be operated on. So here's one that we treated with a uh, rotting of the uh, ulna, and then the radius uh, will behave itself after that. Um, these do sometimes get missed. They can uh, re-dislocate late, so you have to kind of watch them carefully. And they require about six weeks in a cast. They take a little bit of time to uh, heal in after they've been reduced. Um, and if, you, uh, if, if they go on to late recurrent dislocation of the radial head, you sometimes need to repair the annular ligament. Um, they uh, do sometimes malunite and uh, sometimes the radio, radius and ulnar synostose as a result of these. Um, about uh, 11 to 20% of them have an injury of either the PIN or the ulnar nerve. Um, and just a word about open fractures, antibiotics as soon as possible. Um, we even here try to get them given in the field by the emergency uh, technicians if possible. Um, tetanus, toxoid, as, uh, if they haven't had it and are not up to date, give that as well. And then these need uh, an IND and stabilization. So in conclusion, these are pretty common fractures in children. Non-operative treatment usually leads to good results. Um, uh, operative treatment is sometimes uh, indicated and also carries a good prognosis in the majority of cases. Thank you, Susan. Uh, that was a very comprehensive review of forearm fractures. And we all know that even if you try and do your best, you can still end up in complications and complications of forearm bone will be covered by another lady from slightly closure. Uh, she, good afternoon, Claire. I think we are all in a different time zone and I would like you to share your screen and start your presentation. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, following on uh, from that, there will be a little bit of overlap. Um, but repetition is always good. Uh, let me just, can you see that? No. Um, oh, no, we can't see it yet. Okay, hang on. Okay, right there, let me just try it again. Share screen. Yes, you're there. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Okay, Perfect. so just to follow on from that, uh, my name's Claire Carpenter. I'm a pediatric uh, trauma and orthopedic surgeon here in Wales, Cardiff, where uh, COVID is on the rise, but it's probably not as bad as India, thankfully. Um, so what we've heard is, in general, pediatric forearm fracture is a very common part of everybody's practice and on the whole the majority of them can be treated with um, appreciation of fine radiological detail and application of a good fitting cast and Flynn's criteria has shown that the majority of children actually have excellent to good outcomes from this even though probably if you look at the literature um, many children may well have mild deficits in pronus supination of the forearm. However, that isn't functionally borne out in their activities or any disruption to their functional activities. And lots of us spend many weeks looking at small changes in the forearm position and loss of reduction is quite common. However, that loss of reduction, whether it ends up in significant malunion, requiring then subsequent intervention actually is actually fairly uh, uncommon within the pediatric practice. So what we know is that loss of that reduction and increase in angulation in either of the forearm bones uh, from cadaveric and biomechanical studies will alter the effects of pronus supination of the forearm. So, and as a consequence, with crowding of the interosseous space, they may well get some forearm stiffness. And as previously mentioned, 
any residual angulation may actually predispose them to their thereby refracture. But even though we're not seeing um, significant amounts of uh, functional problems, certain children, if they are left with angulation over 20 to 30 degrees, may require a secondary procedure to correct that malunion. And again, nature gave us two upper limbs, so you've always got a, a comparator. And if there is a functional deficit or, or a reduced range of movement, which is approximately 50 to 60 degrees of normal, then you, it may sway you to intervene with the child's malunion. Even though we are um, with biomechanics, the range of movement of pronation and supination is 90 degrees either way. Actually, functionally, we do not need a full range of movement and probably we only need an arc of 100 degrees in order for our children to function normally. The younger the child, the chance of remodeling, we've heard that remodeling in the mid diaphysis is not as predictable um, distally and in the sagittal plane, but they can remodel up to six months after injury. And so it's probably best to wait for about six months before you make any decision. And the literature does show though, if you are intending to intervene, then corrective osteotomy does better if you do it within the first year. Um, thereby working the child up, Obviously, CT is at everybody's disposal now, whether you feel it's useful. It certainly can be, sorry, that, oop, that's going too quick. Let me just slow that down a little bit. It can help you to preoptively plan. It can help you to understand deformity. Um, mid shaft of diaphysis is fairly straightforward and these may well be more useful proximally. Now we can 3D print as surgeons, we can practice um, doing the osteotomies before we go into the operation room. And also for some people, bespoke jigs and bespoke uh, plates are also an option for very complex deformities. However, the good old x-ray is probably the best option to plan for the majority of us. And again, getting biplanar x-rays looking at your apex of deformity, looking at cues, as Kay Wilkins described, looking at the rotation of the forearm and the orientation of the bicipital tuberosity to the radial styloid being 180 degrees um, to each other on the AP, and then the coronoid process and the ulna styloid on the lateral are good cues for intraoperative assessment and correction of this malunion. Um, usually a closing wedge is enough. If you do have a very tight interosseous space, you can shorten further. But again, that is a decision that you make intraoperatively. This is the table from Chad Price's paper, actually showing that when you correct an osteotomy, again, as when you treat forearm fra fractures primarily, there's no obvious need to um, intervene in both bones. You can decide whether you IM nail or plate, you can decide whether you want to intervene with the radius and the ulna. Again, that's a, a surgical decision made on table. Blackburn's paper from earlier um, shows uh, a, a more simpler procedure for uh, mid forearm malunion, whereby they use drill osteoclasis and uh, casting alone for the majority of their patients. Again, I think, in a secondary procedure, it's less predictable when you don't instrument either bone. And I think if you are doing a second procedure on a child who's already had a fairly poor outcome first up, I think it's probably a little bit more predictable to use implants the second time around. Um, as previously discussed, there is a refracture rate. And again, there's a refracture rate whether you don't intervene surgically or whether you use a non-surgical casting approach. And in the literature, it's fairly variable between 5 and 15%. The peak seems to be anywhere between 12 to 16 weeks. And this seems to be at a time where you've got relative osteopenia of the bone, but the children's muscular pull is back to 
where it was pre-injury and they're back to doing normal activities because children will be children and they want to get back to sports, et cetera, as soon as possible. So when we counsel patients, we don't hold them back necessarily if there's signs of radiological union, but we will counsel them that one in 10 children may get a refracture if they return to sport a bit too soon. Um, if there is, as previously said, some residual dorsal, dorsal angulation that also tends to predispose to, uh, to refracture. I remember there are complications from non-operative, but it's a different profile of complication if you intervene as a surgeon and you have to accept that and weigh up the risks and benefits of intervening in any child's fracture. I think the fact that um, historically forearm diaphyseal fractures are associated with um, some element of uh, malunion has has led us to increase our surgical intervention with regards to these children, especially the literature supports the increased intervention, certainly over the last 20 years with IM nailing. And again, you pick your, I suppose, you pick your implant of choice and your side effect profile. And it's certainly within the literature, intramedal renailing does have a high incidence of mild complications associated with it. Um, palating doesn't, uh, isn't completely com uh, complication free either. And again, some of us like hybrid fixation for the older children. Um, this interesting paper, which was 2016, showed actually they looked, they compared hybrid plating and intramedullary nailing. Um, intramedullary nailing was more frequent in this cohort, but they showed that the complication rates were equal amongst all groups, which is reassuring when you're deciding not necessarily on one implant, but what best fits a fracture in front of you. Delayed union, um, this has been shown to be increased with intramedullary nailing. The quoted rates are 1%. Uh, Again, we've already talked about you get three passes and 10 minutes. And again, if you then decide to open that fracture, you're probably committing to a longer time to union and you should bear that in mind with any post-operative care that you provide. If you have an open fracture, you add on another two to three weeks to union. Um, age over, over 10, they're a bit slower to heal and again, the usual point uh, at which you get the delayed or non-union is uh, the mid-shaft of the ulna, and that's already been touched upon due to the blood supply contributing by the anterior and posterior interosseous vessels. Um, compartment syndrome, I think um, on the whole in uh, mid-shaft forearm fractures is fairly low. Um, this was some US data uh, where open fractures, you're twice uh, as likely to get a compartment syndrome as closed forearm fractures. They didn't say how these were treated. It was all comers. However, intramedullary nailing has been renowned with an increased, um, increased rate of uh, compartment syndrome, even as high as 7.5% uh, in that 2004 JPO article. Again, from that, um, the conclusions are always the same. Keep your operative time down, keep your tourniquet time down. Three passes and then you open, or 10 minutes and you open. And again, if you've got a higher end injury or an open fracture, you're at increased risk. Infection is low, as already uh, previously mentioned. Quoted rates are between two to 3%. When we talk about infection in intramedullary nails, I think it's a spectrum from kind of skin and skin irritation to superficial infections. Deep infections are fairly uncommon. Uh, there was one case of osteo fulminant osteomyelitis um, within the literature. For the majority of us, if we get a superficial wound infection, some antibiotics and early nail removal is sufficient. Interestingly, uh, when you there are different techniques as previously been described, where you either bury the wire or you you leave the wires open. I again prefer to bury the wires. It gives me some flexibility 
when planning the second stage removal of the metalwork um, because if if you leave the uh, intermediary nails or wires out then actually you're committed to taking them out a lot sooner but interestingly if you look at the literature there's no significant increased rates of infection when the nails are left open or proud again uh, two approaches to the radius, dorsal and lateral. There are quite a number of EPL ruptures documented within the literature with the dorsal approach. Um, this was a very uh, neat paper from Hungary where they use intraoperative ultrasound to ensure that the nail is left at a significant distance away from the EPL. And again, if you leave the nail fairly proud, as in here, obviously that's, you can't leave it so proud that it's coming out through the skin. But if you wanted to bury it, you have to leave the tip above the, the level of the EPL, because otherwise they get attrition rupture, uh, and then they will need tendon transfers. The lateral approach is not without its problems. Again, even though these are minimally or per, minimally invasive or percutaneous approaches to the bones, it is advised that you you uh, approach them with a decent with decent access to allow visualization of the sensory branch of the radial nerve. Move it to one side and then get down onto the periosteum. And again, there are case reports: abductor pollicis longus and EPB are quite close, and there are cases of injuries to those tendons as well. So it, it isn't without its risk. So if the metalwork's problem, it then needs to come out, or should we remove it? Well, on the whole, we I think majority of us do tend to take the, the metalwork out, either before it's bent, it becomes buried and grows with the child becoming a stress riser, or another surgeon, instead of taking the metalwork out, just plates on top of it. So I think there are positives to taking the metalwork out. There was a paper out of Bristol in the early 2000s that said actually removal of metalwork isn't associated with a 40% complication rate. This was because they left the most junior members of the team to take them out. And so I think that it does need to be treated with as much respect as putting them in in the first place. So you do need to, um, to treat it with a bit of care. Uh, refracture. Um, again, there's always the talk about if you take the metalwork out too early, there is uh, this risk of refracture. The non-C group recommended 10 to 12 months post-injury. If you leave it more than that, they get the nails grow with a child they, they, and they're lost forever, um, unless you leave them out to significant length. Um, taking them out too soon also is a risk. So they recommended 10 to 12 months. In this paper in 2014, they were taking their nails out at five months and had a 16% refracture rate. And they took their plates out at about 12 months and again had a half, a 50% that refracture rate. So again, for us, we take anything out between nine to 12 months in our unit. We haven't had a, a, a massive uh, amount of refractures from the plate removal themselves. Thank you very much. We'll probably take questions at that point. Thank you very much, uh, Claire. Uh, we'll just go through some cases. And uh, uh, during the cases, uh, uh, you can throw some light on certain finer points. Um, would you stop sharing your screen? Yeah. Have I stopped? Yes. Yeah. Can you see the cases? Yes. Okay. So, uh, first is a very usual problem, which we generally get after radius and the fracture. This was a 10-year-old son uh, of my classmate, uh, the gastro surgeon, and fell with uh, this uh, uh, injury. And uh, this child, after a close reduction, had the loss of reduction at one week, where the ulna was angulated at 15 degree, and radius was uh, fairly well maintained. Uh, the reason probably this happened because uh, we didn't use a straight board which Sheetal has taught us how to give a nice uh, straight ulnar border cast. I didn't know that about a couple of years back and that is why it has led to this. 
So at this point of time, I would like to have an opinion poll. What would you do? Uh, would you accept the reduction? Ashok, can we have the poll, please? How many of you accept the reduction? What is the age of the patient? 10 years. 10 year old boy? Yes. And loss of reduction with 15 degree angulation of ulna. So, uh, Sheetal, majority of people say it's you accept the reduction. What is your take on this? You know, the. Uh, we would like to know the opinion of the other panels, but the fracture in a proximal level like this, uh, once it starts displacing, and sometimes even very much from the outset, you know, we have tried to be more aggressive with treating fractures at this level, you know, because there is a chance that this is going to fall further. So at this point, you can think, okay, I can reduce it, I can wedge it, there's nothing wrong. But just if you look at the risk factors of displacement, the level of the fracture, which is in the proximal one third, it's a risk factor for displacement. So, you know, if you think that this is going to further displace, there is a case of, you know, nailing it, just go ahead and nail it. And, you know, we have, you know, been, we have changed our protocol, uh, you know, a little bit that, you know, we have, we are trying less, uh, you know, harder to maintain this in the cast. You know, even if you get a good cast, it's not about the cast, it's about too much of, you know, musculature deforming forces, the level of the fracture is difficult to hold it and mold it in that level. And we have seen, you know, higher rates of fracture displacement. So there's a case of trying to treat, be more aggressive. But I'd like to know, you know, uh, Susan and Claire, what are your thoughts on nailing from the outset in an, in an older adolescent, like between 13, maybe 12, 13 years of age in a proximal one third fracture? So this is exactly one of the ones that if this came to my clinic at a week, I would try an extension cast. This is exactly the, 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 situation. It's looking like it wants to be a K deformity. Um, I've had good luck with extension casting them. Now that said, I agree with you that if, you know, I tried the extension cast and it doesn't work, then my next step here is going to be to, to nail it. I'll give it another week with an extension cast and see how we do. And any other view? Uh, Josh, uh, do you think, I mean, you know, uh, for wedging and for re-reducing these fractures, do you think you would tried at this level or any other tips of how you're going to be managing it? Yeah, so I'll just make a few comments. So as we saw in the poll, wedging has become a lost art for many of us that are not used to uh, doing that routinely in the office. And in most of our practices that are busy, the wedging takes time and our cast techs may not be super comfortable doing that. Um, so it's very difficult to get to do the wedging, in my opinion, in this day and age, at least in our current environment. As far as re-reduction, as Susan alluded to, this would, these are difficult to re-reduce in the office setting, uh, depending on the child in particular. Occasionally, you will have a stoic child and you can re-reduce in the office. And in my hands, if I'm going to the operating room, I like to be one and done, so to speak. And I don't want to re-reduce this and potentially be back uh, a week or two later and having to deal with putting nails in at that point or potentially even plate and screw because there's too much callus formation present. So as you alluded to, Shatal, these are um, difficult fractures to maintain a reduction in the proximal third of the radius. Mm -hmm. They lead to poorer outcomes. And this cast, unfortunately, is not ideal with lack of the ulnar border. There's also a little bit higher um, space uh, on the radial side uh, distally. And I think this will continue to fall. And I would rather just to take care of it earlier, which will make the uh, knowing process easier without callus formation present, in my opinion. Thank you, Dr. Joshua. Uh, Dr. K. Wilkins wants to say something. Dr. Wilkins, do you want to unmute yourself and tell us some your pulse of wisdom, please? Dr. Wilkins, can you hear me? I think we'll have his comments later on. So, can I just ask a question? Um, why not nail this from day one, like Sheetal was suggesting? The child is already 10 years old, uh, the fracture is proximal, uh, you, you are likely to get a good, very good reduction and good outcome with the primary nailing. So why not do that? Kevin, do you, have you considered nailing it from the outset, these fractures? Kevin, have you changed in the last? I have not changed for this yet. I think our, we just looked at a whole bunch of these and we found that initial translation was more important than initial angulation in determining loss of reduction. So uh, for this, I wouldn't necessarily go straight to nailing because it was a 10-year-old 
uh, with a non-displaced fracture are not really translated that much. Um, I do think that an additional time, you know, you have another week or so to figure it out. So you can try a re-reduction, you can try wedging, see how it does. Um, but you have to follow it closely and kind of see. Uh, I like the extension cast idea. I've never tried that, but it seems like a good plan. Just to do yeah. something else in the office before you try the OR. I think, you know, in so, a week, um, if you haven't gotten it to work and it's getting worse, then that's a really good indication of taking the OR and fix either one or both bones. In this setting, I tend to try and fix the radius first. I think that will kind of pull the whole ulna with it and hold it. Uh, and you fix the ulna, the radius won't get pulled, it'll kind of get pushed. And so the interosseous membrane will help you reduce the ulna if you reduce the radius and hold it there with a nail. Uh, and that's sort of minimally invasive. You can probably pass the nail because it's still at least, you know, only 25% translated. Uh, so it should be fairly easy to pass the nail in this, in this situation. Just to answer Rujuta, um, I think on day one, I had advised them that there is one option of getting uh, nailing done, but as a surgeon, he was very wary of doing it. And so I discussed that at one week, we'll take a call. So at this point of time also, the child's uh, parents were uh, advised, offered nailing, they refused. And what I uh, did was something different, which was probably Dr. Joshua wouldn't agree with me. So just to know what, what are the chances of redisplacement is a paper from Sheetal's Institute where they say 55% generally displaced within first week and 95 by three weeks. So what we need to do is to take a weekly x-ray at least up to three weeks so that we do not miss any uh, redisplacement. Redisplacement they found higher in the children more than 10 years where ulnar angulation is about 15 degree or less and more in proximal third fractures. And as per their uh, uh, conclusion, they found that uh, if you found this early, early surgical decision is encouraged. But compared to that, Sheetal's own paper from the same institute some uh, years down the line, uh, they recommended that uh, re-reduction of this um, redisplaced fracture gives a fairly good results and it is pretty less expensive. So I want uh, Kevin and Sheetal to uh, tell us what is their final um, uh, recommendations on redisplaced fracture at about week 10 days down the line. You know, my, uh, you know, when the fracture is in the mid forearm or a little bit distal, it is easy to, uh, to correct it. And, and the, the thing about reduction is down the road, like when you're at two weeks, there is already some soft callus. So when you take these patients to the OR and you reduce them, you know, they are sticky. So they would stay there and you'll get a really good cast. So we looked at a bunch of you know, patients. This is like 31 consecutive patients that we, we, we were ready for nailing as well on all these patients. So, but we found that if we reduce them, we did not have issues you know, with the loss of reduction. You know, that is one thing that, as Josh said, you know, when you're in the OR, you just want to go to the OR once. Like, it doesn't make sense to reduce a fracture, then come back again because you want to now nail it. It's better to just be sure about it. So that's why we did this. And we found that if you do it a little bit later, like at two weeks or maybe about between two and three weeks when there is already some soft callus, you would get a better fit of the cast. You'll be able to mold it well and the fracture would stay reduced. We didn't have loss of reduction uh, in, in, these, uh, in these fractures, but they were uh, you know, middle, uh, middle forearm to distal, not proximal ones. So uh, what I did was... Um... I did a plaster wedging and about week 10 days, it's uh, not very difficult to do. It's an OPD procedure. And uh, I know it's a forgotten art, but I just looked up some uh, references and found a nice, beautiful picture on AO surgery reference. So uh, AO technique also recommends that doing a wedging is, a, is an option. So this is how I wedged and I got fairly good uh, reduction. The angulation corrected to eight degree nalna and one degree to radius. And this is how the child healed on plaster removal. And this is uh, his full functional recovery at end of uh, one year without any scars. The parents were really, really very persistent on uh, not going for nailing unless it was absolutely necessary. And I, I took this. So, uh, Dr. Joshua, what your word on this? Uh, what What would you say about you this? Did great and saved uh, the healthcare system in India money. Which is always <laughs> no, nice. I. Um... I have a new partner and he wedged one of these the other day and it was the first time in a long time I'd seen an, a, a, a forearm cast wedged, but it worked great. So I, I do think it works great. I just think it's really hard for those of us in our clinics, you know, if we have 60, 100 patients in a day, um, it really, the techs don't know how to do it, right? So as you said, Dr. Nike, you had to go and look up a little technique reminder and go do it yourself. And I think that's just hard for us in our setting 
um, even if we are comfortable doing it, to break away for those five, 10 minutes. So could, I, um, could I ask, because um, throughout all those x-rays, that forearm fracture was managed in a polymer. What do you feel about using plaster of Paris versus polymer? Because for in our practice, plaster of Paris is much more conforming. We're not allowed to wedge polymer under any circumstance because when polymer wedges, you get a fold at the apex. And so you get pressure effects. So we, we wedge quite a lot of tibias. Um, we don't wedge a huge amount of forearms. So has anybody got any strong opinions on the material they use in order to mold these fractures? We always use uh, and I think that we they use only fibroblast. Yeah, we, you know, I think, I, Carpenter, if you're concerned about the the um, crease, you can do an opening wedge as well, uh, which can work nicely, and then you will avoid that crease. So we always do open wedge. We rarely do close wedge. You know, that's one of the things because close wedge can kink, and open wedge is much easier to do. And your displacement, you can you can categorize by just opening and putting at this wedge size, you can confirm. Close where you have to be very exact. If you don't get it there, then you have created an opposite angle. So I think let's- Yeah, the other, other thing is the liner that we use underneath. You know, all the papers that you read are like, uh, you know, your regular cast with the regular cotton liner. And we have uh, even wedged with a waterproof liner and not have any issues. So, you know, the, uh, there isn't too much literature out there for wedging waterproof cast, but I've done it, not found any issues, but um, uh, uh, but opening wedge uh, in the concavity of the fracture would uh, would make uh, would make sense. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, bring out this method that this can save few people from uh, surgery. I would now, uh, I think long arm cast has already been discussed by uh, Susan. So I will move on. This is a class classical slide from Dr. K. A. Wilkins. He raised his hand, but somehow we are not able to connect to him. So I will hand over to Rujuta for her case. Rujuta, can you unmute yourself, please? I'm already unmuted. Yeah, please, go ahead. So um, that's, uh, you know, taking... Uh... Uh, this further from uh, Premal's talk, there are often parents who are very, very reluctant for an operative procedure. And uh, as long as you use conservative means and redo something or wedge or, or you know, whatever method you use, your technique needs to be right. And it, it's nothing wrong in really doing conservative. You have to pay importance to whether it's stable, whether reduction is good and the quality of the casting. So... Beginning this uh, uh, discussion, this was a, a five-year-old, extremely hyperactive child who fell from a trampoline and sustained a typical distal radius ulna fracking in the uh, OR, uh, casualty. And obviously, the first choice reduction and achieve uh, a good reduction under GA. Can we advance the slide, Premal? So we have an opinion poll on this. Yes. So ask people what they would. So like. what would you want to do now? This was my choice. It may not be the wrong or right choice. People are free to submit their answer. What would you do? I would request the audience to be a little quick. This this is a forearm and hand session, and let forearm and hands work very well. So five seconds more after this. It, almost 150 people have answered. You have 150 opinions. Yes, so let's see the board. Did you do the same? Yes, I can see them. So I think a lot of people also would also be inclined to do a CR and POP. Uh, it's in a five-year-old child. It's a little difficult to do a POP on an OPD basis, and especially on someone who is uh, very, very hyper. But of course, if the degree of angulation were a little mild, and if it was a cooperative child, you could really try it under conscious sedation like uh, Susan and uh, Claire both mentioned. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. So everything was going fine. It was kept for about two months. I was a little worried about the uh, nature of this child and I was serially monitoring him. Things were doing fine. He went on to unite and therefore I kept him for two, uh, the plaster for two months. Normally I just keep the plaster for about a month and then convert it to a brace. But in this case, I waited a little because he was so hyper and told them to use a functional brace. 
but the brace lay in the cupboard and the child kept on frolicking around in the house and one fine day he was uh, jumping all over and actually trying a high jump from a balcony onto the bed and lo and behold this is what happened he refractured exactly at the same site and he was taken somewhere and given a slab and there was actually when he came to me with the slab i noticed that he not only had a refracture he also had a segmental fracture with a grade 1 supracondylar above what would you do now quick poll please so any questions are on everyone can answer this will you close reduce both will you do a forearm pop but choose to do a cr close reduction percutaneous spinning for the supracondylar will you nail the fracture and uh, also fix the uh, supracondylar or will you plate it and k bar the supracondylar under close reduction so probably you're going to have the poll answer soon now 5 seconds more yeah yes i think the biggest issue with this is that there's a higher risk of compartment syndrome with segmental injuries so you have to be very careful Absolutely. with any kind of casting that you would do for this patient so so uh, whatever the choice is it has to be a very loose and closely sports. monitored splinter cast initially and then you can watch and see i also yes, think so. that, uh, any, you know, any other and the faculty wants to opine most so of the audience seems to be I, inclined towards nailing and close reduction for kidney spinning joshua think, i think you're yeah. going to have a harder time nailing that than you think Um, Absolutely. It the the on the radius in particular, your intramedullary canal is pretty filled in. Um, plus, you've got some residual mal, you know, a little residual deformity from the first fracture. So I think you're really going to have to plate this one. Um, okay. You do need to fix it. You need to fix both fractures. But um, and you could nail it if you wanted to. You'd have to re-drill the intramedullary canal. This is going to be. harder to nail than it is to plate so Susan, you know, Susan, for me this would be fix the Susan. elbow plate the forearm so that he's a 5 year old come from sheetal and joshua yeah no susan i'm saying he's a 5 year old why do you think you can't just treat it conservative what's the i mean is is refracture an indication to do surgery um not necessarily but with the with the floating elbow it is Well, well you know, I, go ahead, Josh. Go ahead. Yeah, so I I fully agree with your concept, Shital, that refracture is not an indication necessarily for operative intervention, and we close reduce them. I'm sure you guys do too, uh, on a routine basis. I think in this case, with the floating elbow component, um, number one, and then number two, the original fracture, while it remod will remodel over time, given a child's young age. I do think it's not ideally aligned and you if you treat this close you may be back here a third time and we kind of were joking on the first case that we don't want to go back to the operating room two times I would not want to see a third fracture here and I think given the uh mal union I'll call it of the initial fracture I would be a little more aggressive to get this into a more anatomic position and address both fractures operatively and my comment regarding a nail um was exactly the same you're not going to be able to pass those nails even in the ulna where you don't um ideally see lots of callus as much as you do in the radius getting that nail through um the medullary canal at we are what 3 months you said uh Dr. Meta uh um, about 2 months 2 months yeah it's just near and pop I mean I just did one on Friday that was 3 weeks old and we struggled to get the nail out the medullary canal and back in um due to callus this gets harder One point yes, I would say you can put a plate on. One one point I'd like to make is that you know the elbow needs to be evaluated you can see there is a medial collapse loss of balance angle this is not a type 1 supracondylar. Okay this is could be this would I would call it you know a type 2 or a type 3 which means that it's an indication to fix it but we would get an elbow dedicated elbow x-ray to evaluate to make sure you know the injury because I uh, you know that needs to be fixed having said that you know I once fixing the supracondylar i would i would probably just uh, just leave the forearm just because of the age 5 year old but, well, but that, i think that brings up one last point shital um i would actually fix the forearm first to provide the stability for my reduction of the supracondylar and i think if you're not going to fix the forearm and just pin the supracondylar it might be harder uh cuz the forearm is floppy 
um, which gets up Kevin's point regarding compartment syndrome. So I would address the forearm and then address the elbow in the operating room, which would give me my stability for my reduction of supracondylar. So I think there is a, there was a question from uh, Delhi gets that in the floating elbow, who, what would you do? I think that that is a very good answer that you convert the floating elbow into a simple elbow by fixing the forearm first and then do the close reduction and peeling for the forearm. Not particularly. No, I, I, beg, I beg to differ, Premal. I, that's not, in, I mean, you know, a floating elbow is not always a floating elbow. That means if you have an undisplaced forearm fracture or an undisplaced distal radius fracture, it's still a floating elbow. Yes. You know, so I would I would treat the displaced fracture. I would not just generalize that all floating elbows, you got to fix the forearm first and fix the elbow next. If it's undisplaced, I would not fix the fracture that is undisplaced, even if it's a floating elbow. So, so here I agree, it, but the question was that if you're going to fix both, which one will you fix first? That was the question. Okay, all right. So then, then I agree. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So I think we'll go to what uh, Rujuta did. This is what she did. Yeah. So what? What actually? Wait, wait. Uh, we the, we actually not put up the slide in between. The story goes that the parents just did not consent for a repeat procedure because it was so soon after the first one. So we had a detailed chat with them and took a consent on table that we will try a close reduction, but should this displace later within a week, then we will have to go in for both. So what I did is, in fact, it's a little controversial, but I went in first and close reduced the elbow. I agree with Sheetal that on table, the x-ray, the picture, it showed a grade A, in fact, of the supracondylar Gartland classification. Uh, but we got a good stable reduction there and Rujita, then we went ahead and voice. close reduce the voice is cutting i can't um, i don't know if others have the same problem but it's you're not very clear with uh, with uh, yeah. it's, it's Sheetal, what she said is uh, what she said is that uh, the parents were not agreeing so she went ahead and did close reduction of uh, both the bones yeah she no did. no on on, on uh, interop what did you find so i missed that so I found uh, that the... Uh, Rujita, can you, can you switch off your video so that we can hear you properly while you have a bandwidth problem? All right. Now yeah, is it better? better? Yeah, yes. better. Okay, so on table, we looked at a dedicated C-arm shoot of the supracondylar first. What we did was controversial. We went ahead and did the elbow first, but we got a good stable reduction there. It was a grade 2A Gartland. And since the reduction was very, very nice and stable, I chose to also go ahead and close reduce the forearm, which again, I had quite a good apposition. I had all these apprehensions, which uh, Claire and uh, uh, Susan pointed out. And Joshua also said that the, nailing this would have been quite difficult because of the callus. And since he was a five-year-old, uh, I myself was a little reluctant to plate it. And with a good preservation of the cast, I got a fairly good result. He went on to unite six weeks later. This time I made sure that the forearm brace was kept on for another uh, two months or so. And he went on to unite beautifully with a good maintenance of the interosseous space. And this eventually went on to remodel. And that's his function at the end of about three years now. Rujuda, one question from the audience is that uh, you have both supercondylar and forearm. Did you apply a slab? Or no, not at all. I used a cast. Yeah. I used a cast. Did you bivalve it after that? Uh, no, because uh, the padding was just enough. It was neither too less nor too more. But I just monitored him every week. Yeah, I would be concerned in the, on the first 24 to 48 hours, like just like you know the others have mentioned about compartment syndrome. You know, bivalving the cast would be another way of making sure that it doesn't displace. You know, and you know. That's a, that's a really good result. So that's that's great. But you know, we we got to be careful. You know, uh, one good result doesn't mean that you know uh, that would be the ideal way of treating. It's just telling you one other option of treating it uh, the the right way. There are other controversies about you know, say for example, this patient did have a compartment syndrome. Would that be something that uh, that that would be uh, that would you know, avoidable? You know, so I think. Uh, yeah, you know, it's it's great. It's better to be conservative, but we have to be really careful about, about the skills. Yes. So we did not need multiple attempts, and it came in quite easily, in fact, and we kept him in the hospital for 48 hours. So when I looked at literature, what we found is that, uh, you know, about these the forearm refractures are very, very common, and they usually occur early on, within 14 weeks, and my case seemed to be falling exactly in the, uh, that. Even with uh, fixation, the uh, results of refractures are quite high, but uh, 
you can get if it's really done well and monitored well you can get uh, results with conservative treatment if maintenance of reduction of the uh, of the refracture is not possible only then uh, orf is indicated uh, next premal yeah uh, Rujita, your voice from, is breaking. Uh, Rujita, your voice is not audible. So I'll just take uh, from here. So this is a paper which says that if you use a brace, uh, there was 0% refracture rate and they used uh, it in a significant number of the cases. And another paper uh, by Peter Newton says that uh, in proximal third, there is a higher risk. And the recommendations are that in the distal forearm fractures, you have to give cast for four to six weeks and additional removable splints for another four to six weeks. But in proximal and middle third fracture, keep the long arm cast longer, that is six to eight weeks, and you should continue splints for eight to 12 weeks. And one of the most important points where what they indicate is you must restrict high risk activity indefinitely till you get a solid radiological union. Because they, when they looked at the, their papers, a lot of patients who had a refracture, their last X-ray did not show complete union of all four cortices. So it is very important that you wait for child to be fully mobilized only when you see all four cortices. Anybody wants to add anything? Otherwise, I think I'll end the case discussion and we'll move on to distal radius because we want to finish in time. Any but I just, I just wanted to anybody? ask, you know, uh, ask the, you know, the uh, the faculty a couple of questions. What is the choice for the entry point for the radius nail? And second is, are there any tips when they are nailing? How to how to get close reduction and nailing, any tips that they can provide, like which bone to nail first, or is, is there a way to uh, to close reduce and, uh, and, and nail? So I would just go through each faculty, the choice of radial nail insertion and uh, how to, how to any tips for nailing? Um, yeah, Susan? I use the radial, uh, the lateral insertion site for my uh, radial nail. And I usually make a little incision there so that I can kind of spread down and try to make sure that nerve is out of the way. Um, like Kevin said, I try usually to do the harder bone first. Um, and that's typically the radius. Um, because I find once you've, once you've locked the ulna in, you can't really reduce the radius um, any more than it already is. Whereas that's not really the case with, with doing it reversed. But every now and then, for whatever reason, that that doesn't work out and I do the ulna first. Josh, any, um, any, uh, your entry yeah. point reference? So, um, I'll be controversial with Susan. Here's a dorsal start point, um, for the radial nail. And I'll just make a couple of comments. One, um, being trained as a hand surgeon as well, there's no easy fix for a DRSN neuroma, whereas I can easily do a tendon transfer and have done them, um, for people that have not left the nail in ideal position. I think the point made earlier by uh, Dr. Clare regarding leaving the nail superficial to the extensor tendons, but deep to the skin. Um, I also bend the nail 90 degrees so that the tip of the nail is pointing straight up. So, and I err on the side of leaving the nail a little too long. So my complication at times has been that the nail has poked through the skin as opposed to um, leading to a tendon rupture. So I think those are the tricks for the nail because I don't have a, I could, as I say, I could easily do a tendon transfer, but I cannot fix an aroma very easily. Um, number two, as far as your second comment, uh, I agree with Susan and Kevin regarding doing the harder bone first, which is typically the radius. But sometimes when I'm pulling and in my attempts to close reduction before I put my nails and I tend to pull and play with the fracture. And sometimes I, you just know, as um, most on this call know, when you pull, you're just not going to get it, right? So in those cases, if the ulna is pretty easy, I will just put my ulna nail in, knowing that I'm going to wind up opening the radius anyway to get my nail reduction, um, instead of potentially trying to mess with the radius and then my ulna becomes displaced. Now I'm going to have to open my ulna as well. So sometimes you do know that, and therefore I'll put my ulna nail in um, and just wind up opening the radius as opposed to wind up having to open both potentially. Kevin? Oh, and my last comment, Chital, my last trick yeah. um, is when you're struggling to pass your nail across your fracture site and get your reduction is to rotate the form and find your maximal deformity um, and then leave your fluoro or leave the form in that position um, and try and get your reduction there as you're trying to pass the nail. Uh, we tend to always shoot in the AP or PA plane and the lateral plane. But if you rotate and get that maximal deformity, 
um, that'll help you get your reduction. Anything to add, Kevin or Claire? No, I'm a dorsal entry person myself because of the same reasons that Josh has. So that's all I can say. Yeah, and I'll balance it up and I'm an, a lateral entry. Um, although I think the more distal uh, fractures are less, you get less malunion if you go in dorsally. I think you get a better straight shot down the, to align them down the shaft, so. Yeah. I've heard that you know, I, there are a few things, you know, one is the radial entry, there is a nerve injury. So I think, you know, always, uh, you know, the teaching point is to make sure you open it. It's not a percutaneous entry when you're doing radial, just like Susan said, you've got to open it. I just, if you can see the nerve retracted, there are more injuries to the, to the nerve during nail removal because it's scarred in. So there is a paper on that. So, you know, by putting it in, you can see uh, the, the nerve, but while taking it out, you may not be able to see it because it's scarred in. So you have to be careful about that point as well. As far as the trick, I do agree that, you know, radius is a little bit more difficult, but a few controversial points. If you fix the radius and then you have to open the ulna, off the radius and the ulna, the rate of non-union or delayed union is more in ulna always mm -hmm. compared to the radius. If you look at the literature across, you know, the rate of, uh, so if you're going to open the ulna, you have to be, you have to be, <laughs> Uh, careful and you have to be prepared for a delayed union on the ulnar side versus if you have to open up the radius the chances of delayed union and non-union are are pretty low and one of the trick which i've learned from one of my partners is to put the nail across the radius first but not all the way through just across the radius just about a centimeter in the radius and then do the ulna so you still have a little bit of a wiggle and you'll be able to pass the ulnar nail and then you can put the radius nail which is a great trick because I, you know, I, I used to put the ulna, ulna nail, I mean, radius nail all the way through and then ended up opening the ulna because I would not, I was not able to open the, I mean, not able to reduce the ulna, but, but passing the nail just a little bit in the radius and not all the way through would be a good trick to get the ulna nail across as well. It's been a just great, a, uh, uh, can we have the last comment by Dr. K. Wilkins? Uh, he has joined us. Dr. Wilkins, uh, am I audible? You want to, you raised the hand and you wanted to make a comment. So you would have to say something at this point of time, sir? Yes. Well, I think one of the things that you really need to understand, especially with the green stick fractures, is that you have a rotational deformity. It's not all angulation, it's rotation. For example, if it's apex volar, then the distal fragment is supinated and you put it in pronation. If the, distal, if the apex is dorsal, you put it in supination. And I noticed in a couple of these, you had angulation, but you didn't correct the rotation. And often when you correct the rotation, that will correct the angulation. So, and that's mainly with the green stack fractures. The green stack fractures have both angulation and rotation. And I think it's extremely important that you appreciate that because most of the green stack fractures, you don't put them in neutral a position you put them in either in pronation or supination. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think we'll end the forum here and uh, I'll request Dr. Joshua to start his presentation on the CD. Please share your screen and unmute yourself. So we can see your slides here. Yeah? Please make yeah, them. I'm just going to a uh, slideshow. Sorry. Good? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so my charge uh, today is to talk about distal radius fractures and some of the complications that can occur from them. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, invitation and uh, thank you for joining us today. So distal radius fractures in children and adolescents are extremely common, accounting for 30 to 50% of all pediatric fractures. The vast majorities are fairly <laughs> easy to treat. Um, they're predictable and have excellent outcomes, but they can be difficult if they don't follow the rules. The classification system is uh, not very well defined. Typically, we will discuss them as physial fractures, utilizing the Salter-Harris classification, with Salter-Harris II fractures being the most common. Um, these obviously have a higher chance of growth arrest compared to extra fractures, but you can see physial arrest with extra physial fractures as well. When we discuss extra physial fractures, the classification becomes the green stick fractures, um, torus fractures, or AKA buccal fractures, and then bicortical metaphyseal fractures. So really descriptive classification um, for distal radius fractures that are extra physial in nature. 
buccal fractures uh, occur due to a cortical failure, due to compression. The analogy I always give to parents is the car crashed into a tree and gets a little bit of a dent in the car. These are stable fractures. There's no need to perform a reduction and they can just be treated in a splint or a, a short arm cast for three weeks. Uh, I think the key is really recognizing, however, what is a buccal fracture as compared to a bicortical metaphyseal fracture where the majority of these are dorsally angulated and occur due to a fall into an outstretched hand. You do need to be cognizant of there being a trend towards higher energy mechanisms among younger patients, including sports participation and um, recreational vehicle use in uh, younger children more and more nowadays. The vast majority of distal radius fractures can be treated with close reduction and casting, as you see here. And there is a need to follow these uh, weekly, but typically they uh, heal quite nicely without any need for additional intervention. So I alluded to the fact that we don't all necessarily agree as to what a torus fracture is. And uh, we uh, published a paper uh, several years ago that really tried to look at the treatment mechanisms or treatment modalities um, when assessing distal radius fractures. Um, and what we ultimately thought was that there's substantial variation amongst pediatric orthopedic surgeons when managing these fractures, and that came to bear out. So we had nine pediatric fellowship trained orthopedic surgeons from various academic institutions, looked at 100 sets of PA and lateral wrist radiographs, and we asked them to diagnose them, what their treatment would be, how long they would immobilize them, when their next follow-up would be, if they would attain radiographs at that first and final follow-up, and how they expected that child to do. And we performed statistical analysis um, on this and did a subgroup analysis on um, the fractures that they thought were buccal fractures. And here you can see um, the vast majority of people in this study were male, um, but they were fairly old, for lack of a better word, meaning that they had practiced for an average of um, 20 years since fellowship. And here's what we saw is that there was not very good agreement, right? So fair, slight, poor, slight, fair on all those factors that we looked at. So we ultimately are likely, I think we all agree, having pretty good outcomes for distal radius fractures. We're all doing it a little bit differently. 23 of the 100 sets of radiographs were unanimously diagnosed as buccal fractures. And um, when we performed our analysis on these, um, we realized that surgeons really have their own treatment algorithms uh, for treating these distal radius fractures that yield uh, good and excellent outcomes, but we're all doing it somewhat different. So there is a lot of variation. So just keep that in mind as I go through the rest of my talk. I'm going to give you my preferences and my opinions and kind of my algorithm, um, but yours may differ um, and you still have good and excellent outcomes as of course I do. Um, that's a joke, but um, I think that we just need to recognize that. So a uh, fracture that needs a reduction, I think we all know this, but just as a review, we're going to recreate the deformity, pull longitudinal traction, and just like an adult distal radius fracture, we really want to improve that volar translation of the carpus for these dorsally angulated fractures. We want to make sure that we don't um, excessively flex the wrist. So I'll just play the video um, one more time. Um, so we're going to recreate that deformity by bringing it back, pull that longitudinal traction, and translate that carpus volarly to get our reduction. Um, when we're performing that. But again, just like in the form, these fractures can uh, redisplace over time. And the literature supports the fact that about a third of the fractures that need to be reduced will redisplace over time. And therefore, we need to be prepared to uh, deal with that redisplacement. So here's a nine year old who uh, fell off a swing, a little bit dorsal angulated fracture, bicortical metaphyseal fracture, well aligned on the PA view, but has that mild dorsal angulation. Um, underwent some sort of reduction, I believe, or maybe just alarm casting. I, I forget the details, but here you can see when they're followed up a week later, really the fracture has uh, substantially angulated much more so. Um, and this really gets into the quality of the cast, as was uh, briefly discussed for the forms. We can see this high cast index, particularly at the level of the fracture, all the space where my arrows are that will allow this fracture to move over time. So, this uh, multiple studies have shown that the quality of your reduction and your cast technique are your most crucial factors for preventing loss of alignment over time. And whether your preference is a three-point mold as Susan showed in her forum talk, 
in the bottom left or just an interosseous mold. Um, I think either one work well, um, depending on the fracture, but the key is to put a nice mold on your cast and that help maintain your reduction over time. Here are your acceptable parameters from a couple of different sources. Um, really, I think this comes down to your experience and kind of your gestalt as you look at the uh, fracture as opposed to really measuring it um, and seeing if it will remodel, but rough numbers as you see listed there. So what's gonna predict your of reduction? Well, any severe initial displacement, including bayonet apposition, greater than 50% translation or greater than 30 degree angulation. Um, if the fractures are at the same level, it's much more unstable and you're more likely to lose your uh, reduction. Then you'll start to see the initial reduction in your casting technique really become um, very crucial in this discussion. So the keys I think takeaway are to get a good initial reduction and get a good cast on and then follow them weekly for at least weeks. Again, here you see that wide space on the radial side of the uh, forearm and wrist region and that fracture can fall into that space. I think the key for us as pediatric orthopedic surgeons is really understanding the art of this and determining if the fracture is gonna remodel or if we need to intervene. And this is true for the forearm fractures and true for Kevin when he discusses the hand fractures. We know in the pediatric population, remodeling is an excellent um, potential for our patients that would avoid any need for operative intervention. And us understanding this art really is what makes us pediatric orthopedic surgeons and knowing if and when we need to intervene. So when we discuss remodeling, this is dependent on the number of years of growth remaining, where the fracture is with regard to a rapidly growing physis. Remember the distal radius and distal ulna both contribute 80% respectively um, of the longitudinal growth of those bones. We need to look at how much angular deformity there is and then the plane of angulation relative to the nearby joints. And just as a general principle, fractures that are closer to the physis and angulated in the plane of the joint will have the greatest remodeling potential. So this is something you can find on Google. And I actually will uh, quite often pull this uh, case up in the office when parents question um, me wanting to leave something in a cast when it looks horrible, quote unquote. Um, and I show them this remodeling over time. And here you can see this horrific looking fracture in this young child that we would probably all say is not um, acceptable, but watching it for a prolonged period of time, 18 months later, um, it's remodeled very nicely, maybe not perfect and we can um, get out uh, our measuring tools, but um, pretty darn good. And I bet you this child had a good functional outcome as you can see. So here's our nine-year-old male that fell off a bunk bed, um, has a little buckle with plastic deformation of the ulna, but a 100% displaced, um, distal radius fracture. And, you know, when we talk about bayonet apposition, uh, even in forms, we talk about it really for both bones. There's not good literature out there discussing whether or not leaving bayonet apposition in one bone when the other bone is out to length. Uh, I personally have issues with that. You can see that this child's already somewhat owner positive. Um, and I don't think leaving that there would be ideal, but it can certainly go on to discuss that. So this underwent a closed reduction in casting, and here we can see it. Um, and it looks great, well aligned in the PA view. And I think we would all agree that's acceptable in a lateral view. And here's a child two weeks later, and we can see we've lost a little bit of that alignment in our PA view in this left picture. We stayed well aligned in our lateral view. And really, again, this comes down to that cast um, being suboptimal, allowing that wrist to fall into radial deviation, which is exactly where that fracture fragment's gonna go. So what are you gonna do now? You're two weeks in, this nine-year-old, uh, you just watch this. Again, this is the art and that this will remodel, not cause any problems. We can see nice callus formation and this will remodel totally fine without any need for us to intervene other than with observation. So can you predict this? I think this is the hardest part of our job. Um, there's this article that came out uh, several years ago looking at malunion of distal radius in children and accurate prediction. And they basically retrospectively looked at 63 children and they were able to develop a complex formula, but it's not practical for us on a day-to-day -day basis in the office to really utilize. So we're still really stuck with our experience and those kind of rough guideline numbers I showed earlier, but really I think you need to go with your gut and understand what will remodel and what won't. So let's now spend the rest of our time talking about what's not gonna remodel. So again, as I said, you may have a different algorithm. This is the algorithm I've come up with for myself. 
um, if I do not think a fracture is going to remodel, obviously I'm going to intervene. So we're going to go back to the operating room. Um, OPs, I think we should attempt a repeat close reduction and see what we get. If we can get it for a distal radius fracture, a repeat close reduction, maybe just leave that there and put it back in a cast as Chital talked about um, with some early callus formation forming, or maybe you put a pin, stabilize it to ensure it's not going to move. Regardless, you're not going to have to do much at that point in time. What are you going to do if it's unsuccessful? Well, then we're going to proceed to osteoclasis um, and try and gently break up the uh, healing. Again, this uh, we'll have a conversation regarding physeal fractures, but we won't want to injure the physis. Um, but if this is an extra physeal fracture in particular, you can perform your osteoclasis. And then um, hopefully you can then perform a reduction to get it acceptable. It doesn't need to be perfect, but acceptable. And then stabilize it. If your osteoclasis is unsuccessful in a metaphyseal fracture, then I'll proceed to a formal open reduction internal fixation. And for a physeal fracture, if I'm in the operating room remanipulating a physeal fracture, then we are either early on, in which case my close reduction should work without a problem, or this is a much older child who I'm going to accept the physeal rest, in which case you can perform a mini approach and reduce the fracture without the need for a formal um, open reduction to fixation with a plate and screw fixation. And then I'm going to walk you through each of these examples. So I know that was a lot of information on one slide, but let's walk through this and break it down. Okay. So as I mentioned, if you go back to the operating room for a fracture that's not going to remodel and you're able to perform a closed reduction, my preference is to percutaneously a pin nose. I think it's minimally invasive with a very low complication rate, it stabilizes the fracture. Um, and you don't have to wind up going back to the operating room a third time or a second time uh, to do anything. So the OR setup I utilize, I flip the uh, Ferrospa unit and um, use that as my operating room table, as you see here. And then I perform my reduction. Uh, reporting. Nice little crack, hopefully everyone heard. Then I'll obtain my radiographs and make sure I utilize a semi-sterile technique. So there's no formal gloves and gowns um, with regard to full prep and draping. We do wear gloves, obviously, uh, but we utilize a semi-sterile technique and this has been published um, in hand uh, last year, I think we published it, uh, but it's really it reduces cost, decreases turnover time and need for cleaning. And as we showed was perfectly safe. So as you would do for a super condo or fracture, um, we just, use a prep stick of chlorhexidine on a sterile towel on top of that C arm. And then we'll put our sterile gloves on and can perform this technique really with minimal cost, minimal waste um, without any problems. So here you'll see me sticking my hand out to get my gloves um, so that I can maintain sterility at the level of the pin. And even now, our uh, just so everyone knows, our tech, our circulator, um, is tech is uh, usually not fully gowned and gloved like that. Just uh, gloves on for him or her as well. And then we'll reduce as we showed. Uh, we'll maintain that reduction here. You see us with our gloves, and we'll just drive our K wire in percutaneously. Um, I utilize a radial start point right uh, on the styloid itself for a physeal fracture. And for an extra physeal fracture, I'll slide my pin just proximal to the physis. There's usually a little lip right there that you can fall on. And whether you place one or two pins um, really is dealer's choice. Uh, one pin, in my opinion, is sufficient. But occasionally, if I think the fracture is really unstable, I didn't love my fixation of my first pin, I will put a second divergent pin, um, but pretty rare for that, actually. And then we just bend and cut our pin. And then um, again, put on a nice, well-molded long arm cast for four weeks. Um, again, I think padding is key. You want a nice cast index, no wrinkles, extra padding around the uh, posterior elbow. I, I will comment on this picture for one second in the middle here. This is again, my algorithm to prevent um, pin migration. I cannot think of a case where I've had to go back to the OR for pin migration of, a, of any pin other than a super condor one time. Um, but I use a piece of zero form as a pin skin interface barrier um, around my pin. And then I, I cut a 
slit and a folded gauze and place that uh, underneath the bent part of the pin, um, which prevents the migration. So even if there is a little bit of migration, the four by four will stop it um, and prevent the need to go back to the L for a pin removal. And then at four weeks, uh, the pin is removed in the office setting and the child is usually placed in a splint or nothing by that point. Okay, um, so that's my algorithm for a fracture that's lost reduction. And then we can have a successful closed reduction in the operating room. So those fractures that we follow for one or two weeks um, early on. What if the fracture now presents late and it started to heal and we can't just perform a closed reduction? Well, then I'll proceed to an osteoclasis in the operating room. So here's this four-year-old male. And again, we could certainly have a nice conversation if this will remodel completely. But this child was initially placed in a long arm cast. And here it is 11 days post injury um, with a fairly good cast. I think we would all agree, not a huge space and it's really falling off and maybe this would remodel completely. Um, and we can discuss that, but we decided, um, to get this into a better position and we went to the operating room and attempted our closed reduction. And here you can see the early callus formation present dorsally, um, and radially, and we were unsuccessful. Um, and therefore we proceeded with a osteoclasis of uh, placing a wire, uh, usually dorsally, uh, right into the fracture site and trying to break up that callus formation present. And then once we did that, we were able to perform a closed reduction. And here you can see, we didn't even get it perfect, but certainly this is acceptable. I think we would all agree for a four-year-old child um, and the fracture is stabilized. Um, without any need for further intervention and a nice percutaneous minimally invasive technique. And here's a child four weeks post-operatively and the pin pulled. So does this work? This uh, article uh, about a decade old now uh, utilized this calloclasis technique of osteoclasis um, when performing um, percutaneous fixation of distal radius fractures. And they had 21 patients all of which had excellent results with less than two degrees of residual healing at final follow-up with no complications reported in that series. So uh, what about this Fysial fracture? So here's a 15 year old who was hurt his wrist a month ago, uh, fracture started to heal and it was re-injured when he was arrested by our law enforcement agency, uh, was seen in our emergency department and attempted reduction was performed, but the fracture did not move. I think this does not meet acceptable criteria for an adult fracture. He's 15, um, likely going to go on to physio arrest if we leave this in this fa fashion, but certainly would not remodel itself into acceptable alignment. So we'll follow my algorithm down. We'll attempt close reduction, which we did in the ER, which was unsuccessful. Osteoclasis, um, unsuccessful. What are we going to do now? Um, I'll show you my mini approach for this physio fracture, as opposed to needing a formal osteotomy with a plate and screw fixation for a volar distal radius as we would do an adult. This would be very hard uh, to get fixation. You would likely need to do a dorsal plate, um, which I don't love. I think you could do it minimally invasive. So here it is, no movement with my attempt at closed reduction under general anesthesia. Here's my attempt at osteoclasis. I knew that the physis was gonna be destroyed and I was accepting that, uh, but I still did not have success. So I performed a mini osteotomy dorsally and took a quarter inch osteotome to perform my osteoclasis and then was able to elevate that fracture fragment and then just stabilize it with a couple of styman pins without the need for a formal open reduction internal fixation. And I've now used this technique a few times um, very safely through about a one and a half, two centimeter incision. You can place your osteotome in and ensure you're not damaging the tendons and um, get a nice correction. It's a nice lever point uh, your osteotome is much thicker and stouter than a styman pin. And once you get that fracture out to length and uh, acceptable angulation, you can stabilize it with those styman pins. Um, and in addition, since we knew we were going to have physio arrest, we performed a distal ulnar pivocidesis, as you see here, um, to prevent any ulnar abutment syndrome from occurring. And what about this 13 year old female off a horse? Here's her initial reduction. Note that the fractures are at the same level. I think we would all be very happy. Uh, cast technique looks good. There's a nice mold, very low cast index. But two weeks later, we could see the fracture kind of fell apart. There's already some early, early callus formation present. In the operating room, we're gonna follow this algorithm. We're gonna attempt our closed reduction. We're unsuccessful. 
I'm going to proceed to osteoclesis. We're unsuccessful. And because there's a metaphyseal fracture, likely difficult to obtain uh, percutaneous fixation, we're going to proceed to a more formal ORIF with plate and screw fixation, as you see here. And note that just the radius, as we talked about with the form, um, was fixed and the ulna um, was able to be um, reduced into acceptable alignment and note without any fixation needed. And here's just one more example, a 14 year old ATV accident, three weeks post injury. Um, again, you can see the early calcification present. Um, note this volar angulation with disruption of the DRUJ and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. And this underwent a little opening wedge osteotomy to correct that angulation um, with plate and screw fixation. So what about some complications? Um, we've spent some time talking about loss of reduction and what to do, but that's been shown to occur anywhere from 10 to 90% of cases. Fisial arrest rate, roughly I quote 5%, but depending on the literature article you read, anywhere from one to 9%. Supination dissociation, I'll talk to you about here to show a case. We've talked about malunion. I think this is key for um, fisial fractures. If you have a uh, malunion and it's two weeks old or later, and a child that has at least a couple of years of growth remaining, you wanna observe that and allow for remodeling to occur. And if needed, once a child is older, perform your osteotomy. Do not perform any osteotomies, as I said, or mess with the physis um, beyond around two weeks post-injury as your physial arrest rate will go up much higher. Non-union is very rare. Uh, you'll see it in open fractures, neurofibromatosis or congenital pseudoarthrosis. Pin tract infections can occur, but usually they're superficial in nature. You just pull your pin and a little oral antibiotics and that fixes it. Synostosis can occur, but again, it's fairly rare. And uh, neurovascular injuries are very uncommon with these as well. So let's talk about supination dissociation. What this is, is malalignment of the DRUJ. And really what this is, is um, a distal radius fracture that was allowed to heal in a somewhat angulated position that someone thought was going to remodel adequately. And as a child has grown, the deformity migrates proximally. So when we look at the right side, the unaffected side here, we can see that the distal radius is nice and straight. And when we look at the left side, the affected side, we can see this slight bow um, to this distal radius that has thrown off the mechanics of the DRUJ. And I believe Kevin published a small series on this uh, recently. So here's a case example of a 15 year old male that was wrestling with a friend when a friend had jumped on his wrist, we see this um, bicortical metaphyseal fracture with what appears to be a fairly well aligned uh, radius and ulna. But really, if we got out our, our uh, angulation tool on our pack system, there's about 20 degrees of dorsal angulation present when we measure up the radial shaft compared to the um, center of the distal radius at the articular surface. Um, so this underwent some sort of reduction. Uh, really, the fracture didn't move, as you can see here. And one week later, um, the angulation is roughly the same, as you see here. And one month, this child was allowed to uh, heal with this and was discharged from the practice where he was being seen. There was some remodeling that occurred. And he presented to my office one year post-injury with complaints of limited motion. And what you'll see is his pronation um, is symmetric, but really he lacks supination on that side due to that deformity. And here are the current radiographs when he presented to my office. And again, we can see that slight um, bowing that's now migrated proximally in the uh, distal radius into the distal extent of the form. And we measured about a 10 degree angulation on this radiograph from the shaft um, up to the articular surface. So what do we do now? Um, this child had a corrective osteotomy to correct that little 10 degrees of dorsal tilt and restore the alignment of the distal form and DRUJ mechanics. And postoperatively, we were able to obtain a functional uh, motion with regard to supination. Fractures that involve the uh, physis of the distal radius to ulna um, can be challenging as well. Um, the risk is much higher once the fracture is displaced uh, and growth arrest in the distal ulna physis is extremely high, uh, upwards of 50% in the true physial distal ulna fractures. 
So risk, fact, risk factors include multiple reduction attempts. So my residents are all taught that at most they will get two attempts in the emergency department. And if they're unsuccessful, then uh, we should certainly be um, present in the operating room with good general anesthesia. And we're gonna avoid those late reduction attempts. So again, beyond two weeks, uh, we don't want to attempt any reduction of a distal radius or ulnar fracture um, that is physial in nature in a child that still has at least a year and a half to two years of growth remaining. What do we do if there is physial arrest? Here you can see a case of distal radial physial arrest uh, with distal ulnar abutment syndrome. We're going to perform a distal ulnar epiphysiodesis, completion distal radius epiphysiodesis, perform an ulnar shortening osteotomy to take and improve that ulnar abutment uh, syndrome, as well as uh, improve the deformity that occurs with it. So here's a case example of 11 year old uh, female who had fallen off the monkey bars. And here are the original wrist injuries. Note the distal radius fracture, but also a true distal ulnar physial fracture. Here are the post-reduction films. I think everyone again would be happy with this reduction. One week follow-up visit, two week follow-up visit looks good. And here we are two months post-op, post-injury, the cast is removed, the patient's told to follow up if there are any problems. And two years later has ulnar sided wrist pain because of physial arrest of the distal ulna. Um, we really don't have a great treatment for this. You could do an ulnar lengthening, uh, but really there's no easy treatment for this other than the completion of epistiodesis of the distal radius and potentially a distal radius shortening. Um, I think the key is these need to be followed. I see them back at the three to four month mark, and then I follow them out until I'm certain that um, there is growth that has occurred, or at least for a year and a half to two years, to make sure that there is no physial arrest. And here's that MRI showing you complete physial arrest of that distal ulna. So we must avoid iatrogenic physial injury, avoid those repeat reduction attempts and late reduction attempts, optimize your chances by ensuring you have adequate sedation. I prefer utilization of miniferoscopy in the emergency department. There are a couple of papers that say it really doesn't help, um, but I think for sure in a junior resident, um, it has to help or at least let them know that they got their reduction. I'm just going to end on this uh, horrible case of a uh, union physial arrest. Uh, this child had presented seven years um, following their injury, complaining of deformity and pain on the owner aspect of their wrist. Um, and here are the initial uh, injury films. We can see the uh, fractures are extra physial in nature, underwent a reduction in casting. And seven years later, the child was referred to me with this horrible deformity and pain, um, as you can see here with limited motion all around. And here are the x-rays. And I think what's really key here is understanding that there's reversal of the radial bow, no, sorry, of the um, radial inclination. And all this is tight. So this is a very challenging operative uh, case because the DRUJ is tight as well as the IOM and um, all of the uh, musculature. And, in retrospect, potentially I should have done some sort of lengthening uh, with an external fixation device. Um, but I just went for it and the uh, child was taken to the operating room for an osteotomy with iliac crest bone grafting, um, an ulnar shortening osteotomy. And you can see it's not perfect and my plate is a little bit off here, but uh, we were able to get the joint at least level and neutral and improve his deformity um, and uh, kill his distal ulna. So in conclusion, Remember to accept, uh, avoid accepting the unacceptable reduction. Um, so if it's unacceptable, address it early. Avoid multiple or late reduction attempts as these will lead to physial arrest. Make sure your cast technique is optimal. Uh, make sure you follow the child uh, closely with uh, weekly radiographs. Remember that a wrist fracture in a preteen can become a form deformity leading to that supination dissociation problem we discussed. Parents must be aware of the potential for loss of reduction in physial rest. And physial rest is really a retrospective diagnosis. So bring your patients back for x-rays on a routine basis. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Joshua. Thank you for taking us through the entire gamut of distal radius cases. We have very little to discuss. We'll quickly go through two cases. Now I'll invite uh, Dr. Uh, Binoti to start with her case. Binoti, yes. are you Yeah, your, so... Yeah. So this is a four-year-old male child with a lower fourth radius ulna fracture with complete dorsal displacement. And this was treated uh, 
with close reduction and caste. And I want to have the opinion of the delegates. What do they feel about this X-ray? Do they think that it is this reduction is not acceptable and they will do a repeat close reduction and caste? They think the reduction is acceptable and continue caste okay, for the child at six weeks for removal. Do they think that it is acceptable, but they will keep the child under weekly follow up? Or uh, do they think that they would want to fix the fracture with KYS because it is unstable? So let's have a quick opinion poll. Yeah, I think I'll ask uh, Samir. Uh, Samir has been quiet for a while. Samir, what would you do? Most of the people seem to be suggesting uh, the third option. Can you unmute yourself, Samir? Ah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh... Yeah. Be a bit little louder. Yeah, looking at this, uh, uh, the past index and everything, the reduction looks acceptable at this stage. But I would definitely like to follow up this child uh, with x ray, serial x rays for about two to three weeks. Okay. So, Dr. Joshua, what is your call on this? What would you do? Yes, this child's very young, uh, four years of age. I think this fracture will remodel perfectly fine. The angulation's in the pain of motion. Um, and near the physis, uh, but I do think you do need to watch it and make sure this doesn't become a 50 degrees of angulation in a week. Okay, so as rightly told by Dr. Joshua, this is what happened when the child came back at six weeks. There was now significant volar angulation and some amount of ulnar angulation. The fracture was uniting, but in a mild position. So what would you do now? Would you do anything or would you observe because the child is small? Dr. Joshua? Yeah, so I think at six weeks here, um, there's probably a lot of callus formation present, and I would tend to observe this, the parents knowing that um, there may be a need for an osteotomy in the future, but I think more likely than not, this will fully remodel without any problem. If the parents really pushed me, I could you could try a, an osteoclasis, but I think at six weeks in a four-year-old, uh, you may not be successful, and I would not, I certainly would not, I repeat, I would not uh, do an osteotomy on this. Yes, so we also continued observing the child because he was young and the volar angulation was in the plane of motion. And this was the picture at six months, fracture remodeling well. And at two years, it is almost completely remodeled. There is still a little bit of volar angulation. So looking back, you think that could this have been avoided? Could this loss of reduction be avoided? And when we looked at the literature, we found that, Premal, yeah. So there are certain risk factors for fracture redisplacement after reduction and cast immobilization for displaced distal radius fracture. A very nice meta-analysis recently published, which suggested that if you have fracture of at both bone forearm at the same level, and if there is complete displacement of distal radius on pre-reduction X-ray, and if you get a non-anatomical reduction, then there are very high chances of redisplacement. And then it is better that you do a primary KYR fixation in order to prevent loss of reduction. This all factors were there in our patient. And I think this, if it would have been done with KYR fixation, we would have avoided loss, loss of reduction. By chance, if you don't have these factors and you're trying to continue to treat and plaster, then you require a very good cast for it to be maintained well till it unites. So this paper, again, recent JPO paper, which says that which uh, index predicts best the loss of reduction? Well, they say that cast index is very useful. It is very simple to calculate, very much reproducible. And to curb the risk of reduction loss in distal forearm cast in children, you should have an adequate reduction. Your cast should be oval in shape and you should have reduced padding so that it maintains the reduction well. And surprisingly, they said that cast ulnar molding and three-point fixation principle do not seem to be relevant for loss of reduction risk. Next, very nice paper. Again, sometimes you see that uh, you don't have uh, various facilities available. And many times this bayonet position is reduced. Plaster is, uh, the fracture is not reduced and it is just put in cast the way it is. And this paper says that there is close treatment of overriding distal radius fractures without reduction in children still unites pretty well uh, if, if the patient is younger and if you have no angulation and just displacement with little bit of overriding. So close reduction with conscious sedation or GA is five to six times more expensive and sometimes to cut the cost, you may use just immobilization, thinking that there's no angulation and it's just pure bayonet position. So, so any comments on this, Dr. Joshua? So this was what our patient 
if we would have just left it, would it have been a better result or any comments by any of the other panelists? I agree that uh, I think it's easier sometimes to leave it like this because you just have to control angulation. And it's easier to control angulation when the fracture is uh, bayonet at position uh, because there's not as much tension on the fracture from the muscles. So sometimes by reducing it, you're putting extra tension on it and it makes it harder to hold it. But in a four-year-old, I think either way is a good option. Uh, we've been trying to figure out a way to do a more randomized trial here where we can show that leaving it you know, mal-reduced but straight uh, is as effective as reduction uh, and maybe more effective because you're doing less, uh, less sedation, less time in the OR, less uh, remolding casts, that sort of thing. So. But I do think the key is both bones must be fractured and shortened. I would not leave it if it was just the distal radius shortened because I, I'm concerned about owner abutment um, and owner positivity. I don't know, Kevin, if you have a thought on that. I don't know, in, in a four-year-old, I've not seen an ulnar abutment be symptomatic, but then again, we haven't done enough of these to know. So suppose this was eight year old uh, and with the same X-ray, both bone forearm and shortening, would you would you uh, reduce under general NSHA with the technique you showed or you will just accept this and put plaster in eight year old with a similar injury? So um, all these are seen in our emergency department and undergo conscious sedation with attempt at close reduction. Um, by our resident staff and casting. So um, we tend to see them at that five to seven day point um, following their attempt at close reduction. And that really gives me insight into whether or not the fracture is somewhat stable um, or if the resident didn't have success after one or two attempts, then um, we would address that in the operating room. So I think a country like India, if uh, somebody just treats it on an OPD basis, collects the angulation and accepts even at position, I think it can still lead to good results. That is what uh, this patient, the paper tells us. So, we so you know, if the patient, uh, uh, if the patient, uh, you know, uh, comes to your clinic with this fracture, I agree that you know you can accept it. But you know, here the patients are going to come to the ED. So I agree with the approach that you know one attempt at reduction is not one approach means one time you need under constant sedation because you know they are, they do have a deformity so you know the 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 parents would would like you to do something about it and not just leave it I mean as Kevin said just leaving it you know and not attempting a reduction maybe you know uh, you know in future studies if it shows to be you know the same results I, I, and I think it would I, I'll be okay but. For now, I think when they show up in the ED, we would at least attempt a reduction on all fractures that are going to remodel. Even if we know that they are going to remodel, we are, we are going to try to decrease the deformity, you know, so at least when it heals, it's not as deformed as it was before. Because if you practically, you can leave all fractures in the kid, four year old, and it would remodel, but we still attempt reduction on all these fractures. So um, I would agree with that approach, but, you know, maybe, you know, in future we'll know if we, if we don't attempt reduction, what is going to happen. I, I would. Um, I would leave it if they come to the clinic, I would not take them to the OR to do a procedure. But when they come to the ED, at least I would give an attempt. But you know, I would just, I would just make a couple of uh, quick points. Uh, Josh, that was a great talk. You know, we had a lot of good cases and a lot of uh, cases were discussion because of you know, lack of time, probably we'll have to uh, skip a lot of questions. But just one quick question, which even Susan had and I had is the semi technique that you showed just putting a glove on. Have you had any infection, number one? And second is that, you know, you were concerned with the radial entry uh, nail with the uh, injury to the uh, to the SPN, the superficial radial nerve. When you're doing percutaneous spinning, are you concerned or is there a way to avoid it? Like do you oscillate and uh, put the KOR in or how do you prevent uh, uh, the nerve getting uh, trapped? Great, so um, I was hoping we'd have some discussion. So let's go to uh, semi sterile technique first. Uh, I wish I had popularized that initially, but I was not as a, uh, most of the panelists are aware that was popularized down in Miami as the Miami technique for uh, super condor mm -hmm. fractures. And I just felt as though we could be doing it on everything in the upper extremity, uh, given the low infection rate overall. Um, we did not have any infections in my series that I published in hand and the Miami series of super condor fractures that had over 300 fractures also did not have any infections. Um, I think the infection rate is the same, to be honest with you. It's very low, well under 1% whether I utilize a semi-sterile technique or a full prep and drape. But the advantage of really, um, forget the time, because I think the time comes out to five to 10 minutes. It's not a huge time, but uh, really the medical waste, as you know, Chital is a huge problem 
medical waste and cost, especially in the US, um, not needing those drapes and gowns. Um, really, my supercondor fracture average is $90 for all equipment, right? And that goes up to about $150 um, to $200 when we utilize full gowns and drapes. So we're really trying to get rid of that medical waste and that extra cost without any harm to the patient by not increasing the infection rate. Um, and the second comment I would uh, say is the difference between the K wire and the nail insertion is to put the nail in, you have to either use an awl, uh, which I think would be safer, but the technique I utilize is to create my cord economy with a drill. And I think that's where you'll get into trouble um, with your SRBN. Um, and even if you're using an all, I think we tend to want to do this minimally invasive. So we, as you alluded to for the um, scar tissue for removal or whoever did, um, we retract. And I think we can get neuropraxia type injuries, even if we don't wrap the nerve from the pulling. Whereas with the K wire percutaneously, um, typically if your wire is on the bone, you're, it's pushed the nerve out of the way and you're not going to spin your nerve around your K wire. So I do not utilize oscillate. I just place my K-wire by hand, make sure it's on bone, and then drive it in. I have not had, nor am I aware of any um, reports of nerve injury from a percutaneous K-wire placement. I think the other key is that smooth K-wires tend not to wrap up anything, but threaded K-wires and drills do. So if you use a smooth pin, it doesn't seem to wrap up the tissue at all. So uh, good to know. I think we are running short of time, so I'll request Kevin to go ahead with this talk. It's a very important talk. Uh, we can take the cases somewhere in a bonus session or somewhere. Yes. And Joshua has covered it very well. So, Kevin, please share your screen and start your presentation, please. Sure. Hold on. Uh, it's not letting me share my screen right now. Can you send a request to him? Not the typical buttons that let me share my screen. Hmm. Interesting. Is there a bar that comes in the bottom part of your talk? It's not coming? No, it's not coming. You can minimize and maximize again and see. Yeah. Will you be able to help? Yeah, I'm setting it up. Uh, uh, Josh, you know, I find the toughest fracture is the one which is at the metaphyseal diaphyseal junction as far as fixation is concerned, whether to use, you know, K wires, nails, plates. I saw that you used a very small plate. What size plate was it? And what do you think would be uh, the alternative modes of fixation? Yeah, so I think um, that's a great question. And I was actually going to bring it up on the forum talk. I knew we were short on time. Um, I think one key difference for us as pediatric orthopedic surgeons, I mean, Kevin and I are both trained as adult hand surgeons as well, um, is that in children, we're going to hold them. Um, for Dr. Mehta's case with the ADHD child, right, we have lots of children, we don't trust them, so we're going to hold them in a cast or a, some sort of splint, whereas an adult, we really want to get them moving earlier. So to answer your question, Chital, we can utilize a small plate, um, quite often a 2.5 or 2.7, with really only four cortical fixation which goes against AO principles that were designed for adults, but we really just need to hold our reduction just like a K-wire. So small plate fixation, I think is totally fine because we're gonna keep that child in some sort of a mobilization for a prolonged period of time. Um, and then in 10 seconds, I'll just comment. I think um, the diaphyseal, um, metaphyseal junction are always difficult. Uh, it's actually really to me, the distal third of the diaphysis that becomes the problem. Uh, I just did one on Friday, I put a nail um, but it's really just knowing if you think you're going to have enough space to get your nail in um, to treat it, or if you're really lucky, sometimes going up a K wire size to a small stem and pin will allow you to push on that pin to get down the shaft further. There's another nice trick you can utilize. Yeah, nice. Okay. Yes, Kevin, please start. All right, thank you. Sorry for the technical delays. I know we're running a little bit behind, so we're going to try catch up a little bit. Um, I don't have anything to disclose except we just published a really excellent textbook about pediatric hand trauma. So if you want an in-depth and comprehensive look at what I'm gonna talk about, this is a great uh, 
uh, a great resource for you guys. I have no uh, royalties from this book at all. It all goes to the ASSH. Uh, but uh, please, hopefully, uh, everyone finds it useful. Uh, we're going to go over a few things. Uh, we have uh, 17 bones to talk about uh, in the same amount of time that everyone else talked about one or two bones. So I'll we'll have to kind of go through it a little bit quickly. Um, but hand trauma is common, right? Uh, the hand and wrist are used to explore the world. Uh, it is the most injured part of the child's body. Uh, you know, one third of all fractures are in the hand and wrist. And even like 2% of all ER visits are related to hand injuries because you get your hand stuck in something or putting it out there in the world, catching your fall. Most of these fractures occur around at home up to age six, getting pinched in doors, other things. Uh, as they get older, they're more on the playground, sports injuries, uh, and you can even have work injuries in the teenage uh, population. Uh, the border digits are the most common. So half of all fractures happen in the small finger ray uh, and about a quarter to the thumb. Uh, and the rest are, uh, are the other three fingers. Uh, there is a bimodal distribution uh, around age two where you get the toddler injuries, fingertip smashes, uh, and then up to age 12, you get more sports injuries around school, especially as they're going through growth spurts. Uh, they tend to be a little bit clumsier uh, and uh, tend to fall more. Uh, most of these fractures in the hand are not displaced uh, and outside of the physis at about one, uh, only about uh, one in four are, are problematic. And those are the ones that we need to talk about. So we want to recognize those uh, bad actors, right? The bad actors that are going to come out uh, and, and be bad for you. So I'm going to uh, show that picture. If you see that picture, then it's a bad actor uh, fracture that we're going to talk about a little bit. I think Al Swanson had the best sort of quote about hand, uh, hand fractures because they can be complicated by deformity from, uh, from uh, by poor treatment, stiffness from overtreatment, and both stiffness and deformity uh, by poor treatment. So you want to make sure you treat them appropriately, but don't be too aggressive or too lenient in your fractures. Uh, and then Dr. My mother always said nobody likes crooked fingers, which is true. So we make sure that you evaluate for crooked fingers at all times when you're treating these fractures. In general, in kids' fractures uh, in the hand, uh, they heal, right? They pretty much heal except for scaphoids. Uh, and then physial fractures generally don't cause a growth arrest like they do in the radius and ulna. Uh, and so we don't have to worry about them quite as much. Uh, though angulation displacement can remodel over time, just like Josh said, we want to make sure we see these fractures and know the ones that are going to remodel and ones that are not. Uh, but the malrotation does not ain't correct. So you want to make sure you assess for malrotation on any fracture in the hand, uh, metacarpal uh, out to the fingertips. Uh, skeletal maturity is also different. It's very, very complicated. Uh, but ge in general, your distal phalanx uh, stops first, and then your proximal phalanx second, middle phalanx somewhere in between. Uh, metacarpal is the thumb first, uh, and then the index through small finger metacarpals, uh, and then the distal raised and ulna close. We tend to think of the, the thumb uh, metacarpal base closing about a year before the distal radius metacarp, uh, it's radius ulnar, uh, ulnar physis. Uh, and then the scaphalunate distance starts off very wide, as you can see in this picture, uh, but then becomes normal around 11 to 15 in females and 12 to 17 in males. When I see these patients, it's important to get a good history. Like what exactly did they do? Did they fall? You know, did they jam their finger? Did they hyperextend it? Did they pull on the finger and make it straight right away? Because if it is, then it maybe it's a more unstable fracture. Also look for neurovascular status, any numbness, tingling, dysfascularity, and trying to figure out where it hurts the most. You can get a kid to tell you where it hurts precisely, uh, you know, where it hurts the most. They might be able to tell exactly where the fracture is uh, and help you out. Um, then the physical exam. Uh, for me, I always start with inspection, especially in kids who are a little bit, you're just going to look, you're not going to hurt them. See what things look like, look for any kind of open injuries, abrasions, deformity. Uh, and then look for range of motion, see if there's anything going on that causes loss of motion, uh, and then palpation, right? Try and figure out where it hurts the most. Start where it doesn't hurt, and then at the very last, if you suspect a fracture there, that's the point you hurt them, you touch the most. Uh, and then look for malrotation, uh, something like this, where you can see it's very really clearly malrotated on the ring finger side, away from the middle finger. Uh, make sure you assess that. You can do that with a uh, combination of tenodesis, where you get the wrist back and the fingers flexed, and then some special tests, looking for collateral ligament stability. MCP joint, you have to flex the fingers down to assess for collateral ligament instability rather than extended. Uh, and then uh, the volar plate stress test uh, and Elson test for central slip tendon injury. We'll go over that later. When you're evaluating a hand radiographically, you want to make sure you get uh, metacarpal level. You want to get three views of the hand, uh, AP lateral and oblique. On a finger fracture, you want to make sure you get a finger x-ray and the wrist level, a carpus level fracture. You're going to get uh, scaphoid view uh, as well as AP lateral on the wrist. Sometimes you need stress views as well. 
Uh, this is a patient who had a finger injury on uh, seen on a hand film, which looks non-displaced. We got finger x-rays that actually showed a displacement better and they ended up with finger pinning because of the, uh, of the deformity. Uh, so make sure you get a, an x-ray of the finger for a finger fracture. Starting in the cop, in the carpus, uh, carpal fractures are uncommon, uh, mostly because the, the carpus is very soft uh, and cartilaginous and protected by thick and stout ligaments. Uh, in, these injury, uh, in these cases, ligament disavulsion fractures are more common, but you can see weird fracture patterns like this uh, uh, in kids where the, scaph uh, the capitate uh, and other fractures are happening. The scaphoid is the most common uh, carpal fracture, but it's only uh, half of 1% of all fractures in kids. Most of the time it happens from a fall of outside since peaks around 15 years of age and it's very very under age 10 because the uh, the scaphoid is really only ossified distally at that point. In our uh, clinic we see a lot of patients with potential scaphoid fractures and they are a bad actor because you can't always see them and you may just blow it off or we get a lot of football players who have a wrist sprain quote unquote uh, who then blow it off for the season and come in at the end of the season or the next year say my wrist still hurts and they have a scaphoid non-union. So in our case, if we have an unclear diagnosis, we get an MRI if we can, uh, because that's the best way to tell if it's actually broken or not. And if it's displaced, or you want to get a CT scan at that point to get the best look at the pathoanatomy. So this patient, we have an 11-year-old male. Uh, he fell off his uh, skateboard and attended a patient to the snuff box. If we looked at his x-ray. You can see very, very carefully and very subtly, there's a distal pole skateboard fracture. Uh, CT scan confirmed that the distal pole was fractured, but not displaced. And he was successfully in a cast. Uh, and generally, a distal pole is four to six weeks. Uh, anything from the waist to the proximal pole is somewhere between six to 12 weeks to heal. If you look at the fracture algorithm here, that uh, published by Golson and Bay in 2011, uh, looking at any kind of acute fracture, the only ones you have to worry about are acute displaced waist and proximal pole fractures. They have less than 25% union rate. Uh, so uh, anything in the non-displaced category, even in the proximal pole, will heal pretty well, uh, though it can take a long time for that to happen. Um, proximal pole fractures do have the highest rate of non-union, uh, and they can lead to ABN of the proximal fragment, especially because they're hard to see and sometimes don't show up right away. Um, scaphoid non-union uh, is a problem too. Uh, the biggest risk is degeneration of the wrist, this scaphoid non-union advanced collapsed arthritis problem. We don't really see that in kids, but it can take up to five years in adults. So we don't know exactly how long it's gonna take. Uh, these are treated uh, successfully generally with ORIF and bone grafts, uh, but they are very common as the initial presentation, right? These kids played football, had a wrist sprain, didn't see a fracture, everything's good, but they didn't show up six to nine months later. Uh, we were doing a better job recently of tracking these and identifying them early. So only 25% in the most recent series are showing acutely uh, as a chronic injury. Uh, it was 50% uh, previously. The chronic scaphoid fractures are a little bit opposite. The only the ones that we worry about uh, are all of them, except for non-displaced distal pole chronic fractures. Those are the ones that can heal. So if you have a chronic, which is greater than eight weeks out from injury, with a non-displaced distal pole fracture, then you can probably treat that in the cast. Everything else probably needs to be fixed because uh, it has a 50% union rate with casting or not. The other thing that we see sometimes is humpback deformity. The scaphoid will collapse over time because of the motion that you have. Mid-carpal joint uh, motion, the scaphoid links the proximal row to the middle row. So any motion through the joint causes some wiggling of the scaphoid. That scaphoid then collapses. Um, this is then healed, uh, treated with uh, just a radius uh, bone grafting, right? You open up the fracture, you uh, correct the humpback deformity, place some bone graft in there and place a screw. The bone graft does not have to be structural like it used to be. We drilled out a canal and placed a chunk of bone in there to hold the reduction as the screw is holding the reduction better. Uh, but you definitely need bone graft because it's a wide open hole that you have to bone graft with the scaphoid. Moving on uh, up the hand, another bad actor is the pediatric Bennett fracture. This is a Salter Harris four or three fracture uh, and dislocation of the CMC joint. Uh, it's uh, a difficult one to see sometimes, uh, and sometimes you don't know what it looks like uh, on x-ray. So a CT scan can be helpful. These can displace over time, even with appropriate treatment. Uh, I know Josh has some uh, good uh, uh, series of these uh, with patients that look like a non-displaced Bennett fracture that just displaced and the joint subluxated over time. Uh, so these need an anatomic reduction, either closed or CRPP or open. Right. If you can maintain an anatomic reduction, it will heal, but it has to be protected uh, and appropriately treated and identified early. Uh, in contrast, the extra articular or extra ficeal metacarpal base fractures are much more lenient in the thumb. Uh, there's excellent remodeling because there are multiple planes of motion of that 
uh, physis, uh, and uh, they can be treated closed. It needs a pretty good angulation, more than 45 degrees or so, before I consider treating it. The difficult part is because of all the swelling in the thumb, it is impossible to splint a fracture and reduce it at the same time. So if it's displaced enough that it needs to be reduced, it probably needs to go to the OR for pinning. Otherwise, it will not stay in the right spot and you'll be back again. So if you do see this fracture and need reduction, take the OR for pinning. These fractures can also uh, have a mechanism that makes it a little bit tricky, right? This fracture looks non-displaced, nothing to worry about, but the actual injury was a blast with a homemade bomb the kid was making. So he blew his thumbs off. And if you look at the clinical picture, you can see like this is actually an unstable fracture. Fortunately for him, he, he healed well with just uh, pinning uh, and had no physeal arrest. So you can see that the physis of the fingers is generally more, much more immune to growth arrest problems than others. Metacarpal base fractures in the fingers uh, are usually better tolerated uh, unless they're associated with CNC dislocations. The biggest issue with these is they can be a crush injury uh, and cause compartment syndrome. Uh, CMC fractures, uh, dislocations at the fifth uh, and fourth metacarpals uh, uh, are associated, or hamate fractures can be associated with, with each other. So beware of the ring and small finger metacarpal base fractures and look for CMC or hamate fractures as well. Oftentimes a CT scan is needed for those. Um, this is a kid who showed up in our office a day out from having a large TV fall on their hand. The fractures were non-displaced, but the swelling was severe uh, and they had a, a, a compartment syndrome in the office. Fortunately, they were only a day out from their injury uh, and we were able to take them to the operating room and release the compartments. They healed remarkably well without any fixation, just compartment release and splinting uh, and then casting and they healed completely well. Uh, so you can see it's really more of a soft tissue crush injury than it is a bony injury that leads to compartment syndrome in these patients. Going up the hand a little bit more, the metacarpal shaft, uh, it's more common in the border ridges because of uh, their finger getting caught or by punching injuries. Uh, you can get an extensor lag due to shortening, though that can remodel over time in patients that have some growth. Uh, and these should be fixed if they're unstable or malrotated. So you need to check the malrotation for these. A screw is a good technique in the skeletally mature patient, uh, although you can have complications like this where you see one of these screws actually fractured because the child decided to go back and play basketball before they were allowed uh, to uh, resume. The boxer fracture, uh, that's another one that's somewhat tricky, but the only debate really is how much angulation is okay. Uh, in general, my rule is about 60 degrees or less, it's totally fine, especially if they have open growth plates uh, and can remodel. If they have any kind of malrotation or they have any comminution instability, then you might need a cast. Or if there are multiple metacarpal neck fractures, a metacarpal neck of the small, a metacarpal shaft of the ring, then it's harder to hold them uh, in an adequate alignment. And those will often need either pinning or uh, uh, screw fixation. These tend to happen over and over again, just because they don't learn to stop punching things, uh, especially the teenage males. So we have to try and protect them and then educate them about how not to punch things. One of the problems you see with this, if it's not appropriately treated, is the malunion. You get a pseudo clawing deformity where the MP joint is, uh, is extended because the, uh, the angulation of the fracture, you cannot fully flex around that and you end up with a significant extensor lag at the PIP joint. Uh, so this is a bad actor you need to watch for. Uh, make sure that they have really good uh, finger extension, no malrotation and ability to flex all the way around uh, the malunion uh, around the fracture before you treat them. So in this one, it had to be treated with an uh, osteotomy uh, through a mid-lateral approach uh, and fixation with a the screw. They healed remarkably quickly and we're able to get back to full motion. Uh, moving up the hand even further, the phalanx base fracture. This is the much, most common injury that we see, the extra octave fracture with a small finger, which I said is 52% of all fractures, gets caught and bent to the side. Um, these are either salted two fractures or metaphyseal fractures, uh, and they are very, very stable injuries. If they look clinically stable and they have good adduction, they can bring their finger in uh, as well as flex without any malrotation, you can treat them closed. My general rule is anything less than uh, 10 degrees, you never have to worry about. And more than 15 degrees, you should consider a uh, reduction. Uh, a fracture like this, even though it's probably angulated 20 degrees and clinically normal in a very young child, they will probably do fine with either buddy taping or cast. My preferred treatment for stable injuries that are not really displaced uh, is just a removable plastic splint that we can make for them and have them not follow up with us again. Uh, if they're more complicated or really angulated and non-rotated, then we can reduce them, buddy tape them and cast them like that uh, and have them uh, wear that cast for four weeks. Uh, one of the other bad actor fractures that we see here is these articular surface uh, phalanx fractures. These are a pediatric skier's thumb injury or metacarpal uh, 
MCP joint ligament avulsion injury. Uh, most common on the index and the small finger and on the thumb. Uh, these can also be associated with a large osteochondral injury. But the biggest thing is the collateral ligaments are unstable. And so you see this injury, you oftentimes have to fix it to keep the collateral ligament stable. Otherwise it won't heal correctly. I have seen these injuries uh, as a stenar lesion too, where the piece of bone actually gets avulsed and pulled over the adductor epineurosis. Uh, and then would not heal without an internal fixation of some sort. You can either fix it with K-wires, a screw, or a suture anchor if it's small enough uh, that you can't put a screw through it. Uh, but the most important thing is to recreate that collateral ligament stability, like you can see here. In this case, there was a small enough piece, but completely evolved senior lesion that we had to fix with a, uh, uh, a, a ligament repair. Uh, another Difficult fracture is a central slip avulsion fracture uh, or a large uh, fragment where the joint is subluxating. In this case, you can see that the joint's falling out of place uh, and this is a large avulsion of the central slip. Uh, these need to be fixed uh, because the joint will not stay stable. You can't really hold them with a closed reduction because the balance of forces is off. Uh, and then uh, if you need to, you have to open reduction and internal fixation uh, or pinning the joint in extension or extension block pinning uh, just to recreate the normal joint contour. Uh, contrarily, on the volar side, a volar plate avulsion fractures are generally benign. Most of these happen from a jamming or hyperextension injury uh, where their finger gets uh, bent backwards playing basketball or catching a cricket ball. Uh, these can generally be treated closed without any worries. Um, sometimes they need early motion just to get the, the finger moving because stiffness can be a complication of this. Uh, you can uh, buddy tape them uh, or wear a splint for sports depending on the sport. Uh, but you do have to watch out for ones like this. Uh, this was a, a older child who presented to me with a cricket injury. We actually have cricket injuries here too in America. Uh, and he uh, looked not displaced initially, and he came back four weeks later with an x-ray and no motion and showing the subluxation of the joint, Forcefully, the triangle sign you see here. Uh, that means the joint subluxated is articulating through the fracture. Uh, he's not able to bend the finger at all. So this needed to be treated quickly with open reduction and trial fixation. Uh, got him to full healing, got his motion restored, uh, and he's back to playing cricket again. Um, phalanx shaft fractures uh, oftentimes are stable, but if they're malrotated or mid shaft transverse, uh, uh, then they need to be treated either closed uh, with a reduction or in this case with malrotation, the only stability is going to be with pins. Uh, so this type of fracture uh, needs to be treated. Um, they can also have extens extensor lag due to shortening uh, and it needs to be assessed on your examination. Make sure they're able to extend the PIP and DIP joint. Another type of injury that we see is the bowling ball injury or a uh, crush injury in the smaller child. It has a very complex looking flat fracture pattern, but the periosteum is intact. These can be treated closed because they heal quite well due to the soft tissue injuries. Sometimes they need therapy from the soft tissue injuries because of the crush injury and the scarring associated with it. Um, the phalangeal neck fractures, uh, sort of the distal aspect of the middle and proximal phalanx are the most tricky fractures that we see. These are bad actors in the sense that they displace over time, they have minimal intrinsic stability, and they're adjacent to a joint and far away from a physis, so they do not remodel quickly. Uh, and so with these, you want to check for malrotation. You see a fracture like this, you don't see much of anything, but you see an exam like this, and you know that fracture is malrotated through that fracture, even though it looks relatively benign on the x-ray. These need to be reduced and pinned. Uh, sometimes in the middle phalanx, you can just reduce them and they tend to hold, but most times they need to be pinned. Uh, and if you do treat them closed, you want to check them weekly just to make sure they're not malrotating or displacing over time. So if you put them in a cast, have them come back in a week, take another x-ray out of the cast, another clinical exam to make sure they're not moving out of place. So the phalangeal neck malunion is a problem too, because if they're not treated appropriately, you can heal like this. And what happens is as you're trying to flex the finger down, this volar spike of bone is blocking your motion. Uh, they may also be malrotated at the same time. So this is a significant deformity. However, if you open and reduce this uh, after it's healing, you're putting it at risk of avascular necrosis. So you have to balance that out. This can remodel over time. If you see a fracture a paper written by my partner, uh, Dr. Cornwall, it shows that there can be some remodeling over time. As you can see at three months, six months, one year, and then two years. You can get it back to a normal shape to the finger, but that's a two year process. If the family is willing to wait that long, then maybe it's an option, uh, but sometimes it's not. So that's something that you have to have a long talk with the family about. Uh, like Dr. Meadow said, you wanna have a good informed consent about all treatment options before you recommend any treatment. Because if they're willing to wait two years and you're willing to wait two years, it might be fun to watch this kind of remodel over time. 
However, in these nascent malunions where it's starting to heal but not completely healed, you can actually break that up uh, with the osteoclasis technique that Josh was talking about. I tend to use an 045 or 062 K wire, uh, which is a 1.1 and 1.6 millimeter K wire. You can break up the fracture callus, use it to lever the fracture back into place, and then pin across it with a couple of cross pins. And you can see here, we got the, uh, the joint lined up better on the lateral view. The PA view was a lot trickier to get back to normal, but they made the finger look normal. Uh, and so if you look at a clinical exam, the finger looks normal and it's able to flex. That's much better uh, than viewing it alone. Um, the other bad actor we see here is the unicondylar fractures. These are articular shearing injuries, which are very, very tricky. And oftentimes they're a lot larger than they appear. You might only see a small fleck on the side, but it's a large fracture plane because the plane is oblique into the center of the condyles. And these require anatomic reduction, either closed or open. Uh, but if they're closed with closed treatment, you have to monitor them weekly because they do shift slowly over time. If you do go to the OR, then these need to be reduced and pinned. Uh, I tend to use a tenaculum clamp or something to reduce the hold the fracture together. Then you can pin around the clamp with two or three pins. I like putting three pins in these because I've had one pin fail. And if you only have two pins and one pin fails, then you have one pin and that's not enough. So you need at least two pins to stay uh, and three pins you can fit generally pretty easily around this area. Sometimes you can pull them through the other sides to get better pin spread, but either way you need to stabilize this. The other one that you can sometimes see is this coronal plane shearing fracture. Uh, these are much trickier to do because, uh, or to treat uh, because of the way the fracture can sometimes be displaced. I've seen this fracture piece be actually floating in the joint volarly and have to get reduced. If you can reduce it, you can flex the piece down, uh, sorry, reduce the piece and flex the joint over the top of it to hold it in place and then pin across it. And so that's what I did in this patient where I got this coronal shear fracture, I reduced it closed and then put some pins across it from sort of volar to dorsal, taking care not to wrap the nerve up. So I tend to oscillate if I do that uh, versus not, uh, just to be careful, even though I use only smooth, smooth pins. Uh, the other important part to think about is like, if you can't get the joint surface aligned, you need to open it. Uh, and you want to make sure you open it from a dorsal approach. This was a fracture treated elsewhere. I was treated through a uh, mid-lateral approach. It looked like the joint was lined up well with a single screw. However, looking at it, you could tell it this, even though the roundness here looks like the roundness here, it's actually rotated 90 degrees because it's round in two planes. Uh, and so it's not in appropriate alignment. And so we took him to the operating room and we did a dorsal approach to the joint. You can see that this piece was not aligned appropriately. Took out the screw, lined the joint back up uh, and put two new screws in uh, to get them anatomically aligned. Now that was able to be done successfully and get them. However, with unicondylar you know, fractures, there are some complications that happen. Um, malunion can happen even with uh, appropriate pinning because of loss of reduction. Uh, and you want to avoid any intraarticular osteotomy down the road. That can lead to AVN and joint collapse. Um, this patient had a very severe fracture, ended up with AVN. There's really not any way to treat that once it's happened. Um, stiffness is also common, so I, I tend to get these patients into occupational therapy right away after their pins are out or, after, or even a week after screw fixation just to make sure we get motion back. Quickly. Another uh, problematic one you can see here, uh, you know, someone who waited seven weeks from injury, uh, this is a 15-year-old male, uh, and really needed uh, something done quickly. Uh, so they had deformity, loss of motion, uh, and another bad actor. So what we did was a, a sort of a condylar osteoclasis with an open technique to get the joint lined up better, right? It's not perfect, but I didn't want to completely open it all the way up and devascularize it. So I just sort of slid it up, moved it in the right spot. Uh, that can help uh, get some to heal, get some deformity better. If you have a really bad deformity that's much more chronic, like you see here, uh, then you need to do something called a condylar advancement osteotomy, where you take a large piece of the condyle associated with the shaft, move that up. That keeps the blood supply to the condyle intact. Uh, as you can see here, there's the longitudinal, uh, longitudinal osteotomy. Got the joint lined up nicely, put some screws or pins across it and hold it in that way. Uh, it tends to work really well. Uh, that heals really nicely uh, over time uh, and gets the joint lined up. Uh, so, out to the distal phalanx, another bad actor is a Seymour fracture. These are the Salter Harris two uh, or three uh, uh, or one fractures of the distal phalanx uh, associated with a nail bed injury. So, any bleeding around the nail bed uh, is concerning for an open fracture and make sure that these are appropriately treated uh, either with nail plate removal uh, and uh, open reduction, uh, this, which can be done in the emergency department, uh, or uh, if it's not open, then it can be treated closed. 
you know, these also need antibiotics uh, and aggressive debridement. The ones that are hard to see are ones like this, where it looks like it's not too bad. There's a little bleeding. It looks like the nail's intact. This is actually the nail up on top of the epinicule full. Uh, and we take them to the operating room, you can see that that whole nail bed is avulsed uh, and you have to fix that. So oftentimes you'll open reduce it, uh, put the physis back. I tend to fix the nail bed uh, if I can. Uh, and then if you do that, you don't necessarily need to pin it. But if you can't stabilize the fracture, then you have to put a pin across it to hold it. Uh, the risk is that after seven to 10 days, these are often missed uh, and then show up with an infection. If they're infected, you have to wash them out uh, and then don't put a pin across it right away. Wait a few days, two to three days, come back and put a pin across it at that point. Lastly, we're gonna talk about a few joint dislocations. Um, MCP joint are really common. Uh, these can be reduced closed, but don't pull. If you pull, you can tend to suck the volar plate into the joint and, re and block reduction. So a simple reduction, you just have to hyperextend and exaggerate the deformity and push it back into place, but don't pull. If you pull, it will become a complex where the entrap volar plate is entrapped. Sometimes you can reduce these with a joint flush. You can stick lidocaine uh, uh, into the joint and flush it with a needle pushes the volar plate out of the way and can reduce the fracture. Uh, and if not, if it's irreducible with that way, you have to do an open reduction. In these cases, you can see that the whole metacarpal head is sort of herniated through the capsule uh, and needs to be reduced with an open uh, reduction of the volar plate. IP joint dislocations tend to be much more common uh, and less symptomatic. Uh, dorsal dislocations are more common, about 90% of all dislocations. Uh, these can be closed, reduced, uh, uh, and then start early motion. Uh, Volar joint dislocations are much more problematic because the central slip is avulsed. So you need to do the Elson test, which means that if they can bend, if you bend their PIP joint and you can't extend the DIP joint, that means the extensor mechanism is intact. If they have good full extension of the DIP joint, that means the central slip is avulsed. In those patients, you have to splint them in extension to get the central slip to heal. Uh, and then lastly, these complex mutilating hand injuries that you see in kids, they get their hands stuck in bad things sometimes, including tractors or other things. Uh, and these need an open exploration because you never know what's going to be injured. Uh, they often need a lot of therapy afterwards. This is a patient who got his finger stuck in a gear uh, at a, of a combine, uh, mutilating hand injury, but the fingertip was vascularized so they could actually be fixed. And you can see the first kid had a lot of trauma, a lot of injuries, revascularizations of the fingers, got things to heal pretty well. On the second kid, the fingertip actually healed and stayed a little bit shortened because we had to take out the PAP joint. But things are healing pretty well uh, uh, overall. So for these patients, you want to be prepared to fix anything. Tendons, nerves, arteries, vein, bone, joint, physis. All those things can be injured. All of them might need fixing. Uh, sometimes you need skin flap coverage, other things too. So we tend to do quick and easy. Use some pins, do whatever you can to get things to heal. Uh, and then make sure the soft tissue is working. And then go from there. So... Overall, hopefully you got a good understanding of the basics of hand trauma. Uh, they are very frequently seen in kids. You're gonna see stuff like this. The, the, tree is to, the, the key is to treat and recognize the bad actors, right? Find those problems that are uh, gonna be a, uh, an issue and treat them aggressively early. And then once again, always check for malrotation and coronal plane angulation because that will not remodel. So thank you for your time. Uh, I look forward to some uh, more interesting and fascinating cases. And I look forward to my next trip to India again too. Thanks again. Thank you, Kevin. That was a very comprehensive uh, uh, review of the hand injury. I think uh, your textbook will be an eye-opener for us. Uh, I think I'll request Tarun to go through a few questions quickly. because It's a Sunday evening, and uh, we want to wrap up and let people enjoy a little bit. Dr. Naik, I just would like to make one comment uh, technique yes, um, that I found helpful is for these really distal cartilaginous fractures, sometimes those condor fractures instead of the K wire is to sew the piece because the piece is difficult. So that case Kevin had that was turned 90 degrees, um, a technique to utilize in considering your armamentarium is to use suture to put that small fracture fragment back into place with minimal dissection and having to worry or potentially decrease your AVN risk. Yeah, I agree with Josh. That's a great technique to use uh, for large cartilaginous, small osteal, osteal injuries. I mean, that was a great, uh, you know, talk. I, you know, there were so many injuries that uh, we usually don't uh, recognize or are missed or maltreated. So if you had to like, you know, uh, most of, uh, most of the uh, uh, people here, you're not really used to seeing a lot of hand injuries. So if you had to like, you know, point out the ones that you should never miss or you should yeah, like fractures of necessity, like you should always make sure that you don't have this injury. 
are there two or three really important ones that would lead to like disability or inability to use their finger, not just a, uh, not just a deformity where they can still use it? What were those like two or three injuries that you would recommend that you should look out for these? So the, the ones that we need to watch out for are the unicondylar fractures. Those are the really bad ones. So the distal condyle of the middle or proximal phalanx because those lead to articular surface collapse and then they can lead to early arthritis as well as deformity and loss of function. Uh, so that's one you definitely need to look at. Um, the scaphoid, you know, that's one that's really tricky because you can't always see. You know, there is a risk of, of, uh, of degeneration of the wrist as well. Uh, and then sort of subtle dislocations, CMC joint dislocations associated with uh, the base of the metacarpal fracture uh, or like the, the volar plate avulsion fracture that ended up being much more of a shearing injury that displaced the joint. So there's subtle dislocations uh, that you need to watch out for as well. And the big one I would add to that Chital is malrotation and substantial deviation. So you never want fingers to scissor or to be malrotated. So the fracture as Kevin showed may look fairly subtle radiographically, but the clinical exam becomes your most important part because that will lead to dysfunction when the finger is in the way. Got it. And then for these finger fractures, do you have to use a loop or magnification when you're doing surgery or you can just do it like routinely just under floral control? Uh, for pinning, you don't need any loops. If you're going to fix nerves, uh, definitely need something like that. Uh, but not for fractures. Not for simple fractures, no. I wear them in the OR all the time just because I'm used to them, but you don't need them for finger pinnings because um, you can magnify the C-arm and see it that way, so. Great. Yeah, Tara? Uh, you need to unmute yourself. Uh, many of these questions uh, have been answered. We had total 63 questions from the audience. I'm not able to take all the 63, but the important ones we'll take just now. Susan, so I'm going to ask a question to a faculty and you have to answer in one line. Okay. So the first, the, these questions are about the position of forearm. Uh, you know, how do you immobilize in supination, pronation, mid prone, and what's your view on the extension plaster? Quickly. So so what's on that slide there, that standard position is kind of the in theory standard position. In practice, most of them in my hands end up in neutral and it's fine. Um, yeah. And then the extension, the indication for the extension casting. So when you, you've you done your initial kind of standard closure reduction and casting for a, a forearm fracture, and you have one of those ones where the proximal, where the radial fracture is a little more proximal and maybe you didn't get the perfect ulnar border. And when they come to see you in a week, it's starting to go into that K position. That's when you try an extension cast. And that will often, you know, in that first one to two weeks, if you're starting to slide to K, that will often correct it for you. And I'll switch it in the office at that point. So stay on, there is one more question for you. How do you assess the rotational mal rotations? You know, either when you are doing plaster or you are nailing, what are the landmarks which you practically use? Yeah, so the the uh, radial styloid and radial tuberosity should be 180 degrees to each other on the AP. So that's that's the way to check that. Okay, so for clearing about compartment syndrome, how do you prevent a compartment syndrome? Do you bivalve all the plaster or you, you know, after reduction give up? a slab or a sugar tongue splint and then convert to plaster, how do you manage? Is she around? Uh, Claire yeah, Carpenter? Sure. Yeah, okay. Um, so for us, we we never um, split the cast because for all our reductions need to come into the hospital. So we will keep them for four to six hours observation post. We don't tend to bivalve the cast, although I do advise our junior trainees if they are um, molding. So I think molding a mildly angulated fracture in the ED is different from an off-ended fracture that needs full closed reduction. It's a different energy of maneuver. So for the molded cast um, that goes from the ED, because the trainees are doing it, they go with a... Um, 
with a temporary splint or a bivalve cast. Those that come into theatre for a closed reduction, they will have a full cast, but they are uh, observed on the ward overnight. Thank you. So for Sheetal, uh, you mentioned about proximal forearm fractures nailing. So the questions from pediatric orthopedic surgeons here, do you routinely nail all proximal third fractures and especially proximal radial fractures, how do you nail? No, I would routinely not, not nail them. I was just asking the faculty if the, if the approach has changed over the last, you know, there is more recognition, I think. Uh, so I would always try a close reduction first. But my threshold to do a proximal uh, needing for a proximal third radius is much lower than for middle forearm and you know distal third. So uh, uh, age-wise, usually about eight to ten years is a cutoff. You know, prior to that, uh, I think most of the fractures could be treated closed, and after ten years of age, you know, you know, a lot of these fractures may need a nail. So if I have a proximal third, which is you know, we don't see the patients when they first come in. It's seen by the resident and reduced in the ED. All of these uh, patients are. So when we see them in fall of, if they are falling, I would not just watch them. Once they start falling, I would just go ahead and take them to the, uh, to the OR and nail them because our experience has been that once they start falling, they would just keep on falling more over a period of time. So if you have attempted a good reduction and then they are trying to displace the proximal third, I would just take them to the OR. And uh, is, is there any other question? Yeah, Dr. Mickey has asked uh, a question. Yeah. Yeah, Joshua, you can answer and then- so we'll I just to wanted to add one comment. I think it's very important that um, I employ everyone to pay attention to the radial bow more than the age, uh, because I think that's where we see loss of form rotation and the fracture may look pretty well aligned with regard to translation and angulation. But if you have loss of that radial bow, that child will lose form rotation. And it's more common in those proximal third form fractures where the bone actually looks aligned, but it's aligned in the wrong direction, meaning that the radial bow is reversed. Yeah, that's a big problem, Josh. I, I agree with you. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, again, on nail diameter, because many times, especially in radius, you know, the medullary colon is very narrow and a standard uh, synthesis titanium elastic nail of two with a bend, it's very difficult to negotiate. So how do you manage those patients? Do you use K-wires or you cut the tip? How do you manage? So usually the nail diameter is about you know 75 to 80 percent of the canal diameter so the shortest canal or the smallest canal that you measure the nail has to be smaller than that otherwise you would get it jammed you know one option if you have if you find it difficult to put a titanium nail is to use a stainless steel nail because it has more you know power to put put it in at the same time you know uh, it can lead to combination like hydrogenic combination if you have a butterfly fragment that's not separated then a stainless steel nail would separate it so you know uh, we tend to use more titanium nails, uh, you know, if they are smaller than the diameter, we have like 1.75 titanium nails. So, I mean, I've not seen a canal smaller than that, but if you have a smaller canal, K-wire is fine. It's just that it's, you know, the pointed end gets jammed into the cortex. You keep, you need to keep on rotating it to keep it out of the cortex. But, uh, um, you know, with the traditional nail that we have, we have not had issues. Then if the canal is really small, like the one case that, Susan showed, which had the physal separation, that canal was really small. Then probably if you have, you know, if you don't have a canal or it's really small, you can just, uh, you can go with alternate fixation. Thanks, Sheetal. So two very special questions for Rujuta. Please unmute yourself, Rujuta. So one is about parents' apprehensions. You know, sometimes the child is clinically all right, but the x-rays show some bending. How do you manage the parents, not the child? In, and secondly, Dr. Chandak has asked, Many times there is overgrowth of hair or itching in the plaster, and how do you manage these? These are practical problems, and how do you manage? Rujuta, please. So, um, definitely, uh, it is difficult to manage parents, but if you really have in your collection previously managed uh, patients' x rays, that goes a long way in allaying their anxiety. And I think it's best to really sit down and have an honest dialogue with them, especially the parents who are very, very apprehensive of operative intervention, it's a good idea to let them buy the surgery rather than sell it to them. So as in, you must enlist all the problems that you could end up having if you as a surgeon think that the uh, child needs operative intervention, but the parents are very, very convinced that they don't want to go in for a surgery. 
then you must enlist the pro child may end up having and especially if you say that he may need a second procedure at least in private practice that i have seen that works better because people seem to want a one stop shop so that's one way of looking at it of course that doesn't take away from the fact that one mustn't do anything that is unethical as in if a particular age you shouldn't be nailing or a plating and you know you can get a good result with a close reduction you must go with that but it's at these borderline cases where that approach sort of seems to work well and yes sir i mean problem of overgrowth of hairs i think slowly disappears over a period of time uh, it's just a matter of counseling it's just sometimes you know i tell them that probably your child has a lot of hypervascularity and uh, you know there's there are cosmetologists available if need be so taral i think there is a nice paper about hypertrichosis and it has been observed that it generally disappears in most of the patients so there's a paper out there that people have studied hypertrichosis so yes, kevin answer this question about uh, you know if it's a single bone which one to fix uh and how do you decide so do you want to answer that kevin do you typed it very well on the chat but we want you to answer this quickly please unmute yourself yeah so uh i like what i said is i tend to fix the harder bone first usually that's the radius my preference is to if i have a a, a fracture that's not you know too unstable appearing then i'll try and do a single bone fixation and so then i'll fix the radius bone because it usually pulls the ulna into the right spot Uh, and then reassess. So what I do is I'll check the ulna, see if it's unstable in one plane or two planes. If it's unstable in both planes, so like radial ulna as well as a, a sort of volar and dorsal, it probably needs to be fixed because it won't be able to be held in a splinter cast. Uh, but if the radius is stable and the ulna is relatively stable, a little molded splint or a cast will hold the, the ulna stable and allow it to heal just fine. Uh, so I've had good success with that over the last ten years. We've been trying to publish a paper on it, but nobody wants to take it. So. She could do a comment. Yeah, I would just comment on this. There are there are a few papers uh, on one bone forearm fixation that have noticed more malunion with one bone forearm fixation than go fixing both of them. There are at least uh, two series that I'm aware of, and one series saying no difference. So my and and the recommendation has been in younger patients, like age less than ten years, if you want to fix one forearm uh, bone. it might be okay but in older patients fix both and if they are unstable or they are more soft tissue injury it's likely that both of them are going to have the same kind of instability so fixing one may not be able to hold the other one like we think that you know because of the interosseous and because of the because fixing one bone would hold the other one but it's not always true at least the literature has uh, shown that you know there is higher rates of malunion with one bone fixation so you can make a judgment uh, based on the patient's age and how the fracture looks but if if you have doubts i would recommend fixing both yeah so i think i agree yeah. that you have you can't just go in saying i'm going to do one bone fixation and then leave you actually have to assess the situation absolutely uh, so i think it's a possibility in a lot of cases but you have to be very careful with your indications and our paper that we can't publish had 400 something consecutive fractures with a these 150 single bone fixations and we showed no difference in the malunion rate uh but this is with a careful look at how we treat these so so thanks kevin and sheetal so uh, when we nail a forearm bone we've always observed that it takes longer time to heal and uh, one one of the delegates you know very uh, mentioned very critically that when we plaster we remove plaster at 6 weeks but the nails are removed at 9 months so why uh you know this discrepancy so binot you want to answer this question is there any reason or it's just an observation yeah so uh, especially when we do an open reduction to get the nail inside many times if we as we try two and three attempts and if we don't get the reduction you have, we have a very low threshold for opening and i've seen that especially in the ulna and when you do a mini open you are disturbing the uh, periosteum and the uh, uh, vascularity so those are the ones which show actually delayed union so if you've done open reduction to get the nail in i think you require and you keep it longer because we have very high refracture rate there are uh, chances so unless you have got a four cortice union and you know that you are pretty sure about the union i think you are going to keep it longer uh, to prevent the refracture rate or the nail bending inside right uh, so the whole yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, Shita, yes. Oh, yeah, no, um, I, I just we need to recognize that this is apples and oranges because we typically are nailing fractures that are more displaced um, and that are worse angulated. 
and that we can't necessarily just compare those to ones that we would treat with cast mobilization alone. They're really not the same fractures. The other point, uh, you know, I would like to make is the relative stability, just the basic principles of fracture healing. That callus is going to be more when you have more movement. So if you have a cast, the callus is going to be more than a nail. And the nail, the callus is going to be more than a plate because more rigidity you have in the fixation, less movement and less callus you're going to have. And I agree with uh, what uh, uh, Binoti uh, uh, had uh, pointed out about the refracture rate. You know, the initial papers from the, from the originators of the technique, Les Combs and, uh, and Metazo, they were removing the nails at four months and the refracture rate was pretty high. And they later revised it to be removed, you know, around one year, that means, uh, you know, nine to nine months to a year, and the refracture rate was low. So it's, it's much higher in the first six months. I would not recommend removing the nails earlier. And that's why, you know, leaving them out is not a good option. And the last question to Joshua is that uh, any tips for implant removal? Because many times the bone grows over it, and at least many times it requires a bigger incision and bigger heart to remove the implant. So what are your tips on implant removal? Yeah, my tip is um, to put them in the correct way the first time, uh, which makes removal easier. So um, as I said, for my radius snail with a dorsal approach, I bend it 90 degrees and I leave it sitting in the subcutaneous tissue superficial to the extensor tendons and deep to the skin, um, which makes the finding it very easy. And it's because of that 90 degree bend, it does not have bone growing over it. And I utilize a straight shot down the ulna and we cut it just beneath the skin and it's almost always palpable. Um, so uh, we typically tend to put a, just a heavy needle driver on the tip of the nail and are able to they start to bang it out and then get a better hold of it. You know, one other tip is to put a suction tip on, on the nail, like a suction tip that's big enough on the nail and bend it 90 degrees. Uh, you know, that may help you to get it out. Um, and uh, we always have to tell the family that it's, it, it's possible we may not be able to take it out, especially if on the pre-op x-rays, you see that the nail tip is kind of in the cortex. You have to let them know because it's, 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 not, it's not something which has to be an ego issue that you have to remove it by making a big hole uh, in the bone. So if it's buried, it's better to leave it there. You can attempt it to remove it, but if you cannot, that's fine. And I think you should let the family know ahead of time about you know possible not being able to remove the hardware. It's always a tough uh, thing. Absolutely. So you know, perfection is the enemy of excellence, and uh, you know you, you should not uh, attempt for that. With this, we end today's uh, beautiful seminar. Yeah, one, one question. One question. One question. Please ask. Uh, yep. You know, Josh, you had you you showed an osteotomy of the of the very close to the epiphysis where you uh, you know kind of created uh, the uh, tilt, and uh, so you there was a big void. And just with K wires, do you think it will fall back into that position, or are you are, are you going to bone graft it, or how how do you prevent it from collapsing again? Yeah, so those um, you probably I went through it fast, obviously with time, but those were Steinman pins. So I went up from a normal six two K wire to two to two two millimeter pins. Um, which I think will hold it, you know, uh, historically in adults, we treated distal radius fractures with closed reduction and percutaneous pinning all before the distal radius plate came out um, and they didn't really fall. That was not the issue with the pins. Um, so um, he was young enough and I, because I did minimally invasive with only a small incision and a quarter inch osteotome, I didn't feel a need to bone graft the acute injury there. Um, so uh, he wound up healing without an issue. And as has, I've done it as probably five or six times now, and I've not had an issue in that adolescent age group with healing. And that, uh, that supination dissociation thing, how can you prevent it? Like, you know, there was, these are minor degrees, like 15 degrees of, uh, of, uh, of lateral, uh, of bend in a lateral view. And we leave that for remodeling most of the time. So how do some patients get a dissociation and how do some patients do okay with remodeling? Is there, are there any tips how we can prevent it? Yeah, so I'd make two comments. Um, and Kevin wrote a small series uh, on it as well. Uh, him and I did our hand fellowship together and we saw some cases. The two comments I would make are, one, I think it's probably more common than we recognize and it, it, there are people walking around with the problem and it's not causing a functional limitation for them and therefore they just have decreased forearm rotation. Um, and two, the prevention is really recognizing that these patients that have that 15, 20 degrees of angulation, but only a year, year and a half of growth remaining, and that they're not gonna fully remodel it. So I, I agree with you when they have two, three years of growth remaining that these mild angulations will remodel. 
but I think our acceptance criteria, we say, oh, it's only 10 degrees or so, but they only have about a year of growth remaining. We really need to be a little bit more aggressive and get that alignment better early on with people that only have that year, year and a half of growth remaining. I don't know if Kevin it's has any other no, like they just happen for unclear reasons. I think some kids will lose supination because their ligaments are tight. And the kids that we see with supination dissociation have more lax ligaments than the DRJ, so we'll then dislocate when they supinate. Uh, but we don't really know why. I've seen some where it should have remodeled and they actually grew themselves more crooked over time because I think the forces across the forearm were bad. Most of them have a reverse of the radial bow, so it's a volar bow instead of a dorsal bow, and that's probably the reason why. Good to know. Thank you. Uh, this has been, uh, my wife has been watching a Hindi full-fledged movie in the other room on Netflix. She's finished watching the movie and our session is still on. So uh, thank you everybody. It's an exhaustive session and we've learned so much about fractures which are very common. Forearm injuries, distal radial fractures are very, very common. Hand injuries also we are seeing in our day. So we end this session here on Zoom, but questions are going to continue on Telegram. And, and if there are any difficult questions, we'll come back to the faculty for answers. Sandeep, uh, do you want to put a closure, official closure to this program? Uh, no, I think it was a great evening. We overshot by 45 minutes, but I guess everybody is still glued. There are 110 people still watching and they're still typing in questions. So I guess the uh, passion to learn goes well into into the night and uh, for the americans have a good day and for claire it was a lovely lecture and have a good evening and uh, binoti rujuta just uh, the girls session i thought was outstanding the boys went a bit overboard but then the enthusiasm was visible for everybody to see <laughs> so with that adios and good night this Thank remarks. <laughs> wishing, wishing, Claire, wishing Claire a very healthy and speedy recovery and uh, everyone stay safe. Good night, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, Bye. Listening, last comment is that the quiz will be put on the groups and will be emailed to everybody. So for session three and four, uh, you know, quiz will be put on by tomorrow and you have to answer by Thursday. Yeah, also please access the treasury, the details of talks and half your questions will get automatically answered because those talks are really in detail and you should get be able to get answers there too. So good night and uh, access the treasury. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, uh, Josh, for uh, sticking around uh, session overshot, but it's great to have all the discussions. Thank you, everyone, all the faculty, Inati, Rujuta, everyone. Great. Thanks for having Bye. us. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you for having us. We had a good time. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much.